Analaco says in the memo the city will not accept the return to service of the LRT until this third-party safety review is complete. City Council will get an update once a new firm has been retained. Now, the method used by Rideau Transit Maintenance that relied on a visual inspection of the wheels is insufficient, according to the Transportation Safety Board. It has asked RTM what they're doing to prevent further train derailments on the LRT. A letter details what they uncovered so far in the investigation from the August 8th derailment. That included pictures released of a melted roller-bearing cone on a wheel. It came off the axle before the train derailment. The letter says the city did not buy a heat warning system that would have warned of problems before that derailment happened. City News Time 901, now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Most areas should have a fair amount of sunshine today. The high just 16 degrees. Now that's average, though. A few clouds tonight near 7 and tomorrow mainly cloudy with the high about 14 degrees. For today, the high 16. And right now, 7 degrees in Ottawa, 6 degrees in Smith Falls. The province's COVID-19 science advisory table will today reveal for the next few weeks of this pandemic how that's expected to unfold in Ontario. While there is cautious optimism here, it's a different story to the west and the east of us. Health experts are calling for more lockdowns now to get the surging fourth wave under control. Here's City News reporter Jamie Pulford. The COVID situation, drastically different storyline depending on where you are in the country. In Ontario, those new pandemic projections will be released by the science advisory table today. The province's daily case counts have so far remained under 1,000 during the fourth wave. But what happens when winter hits? And then we look to Alberta, where the situation continues to spiral. I may be faced where there's three or four patients that need life-saving treatment, and I can only pick one of them. Dr. Paul Parks is the head of emergency medicine at the Alberta Medical Association, joining the call for an immediate lockdown and closure of businesses and schools to get COVID cases under control. ICUs are still on the brink of catastrophe. Per capita, the situation in neighboring Saskatchewan hospitals is just as bad as Alberta, with Ottawa now offering help. And Atlantic Canada's premiers will meet virtually today to discuss the fourth wave pushing hospitals there to the limit. Much of the focus on New Brunswick, dealing with its biggest outbreak since the pandemic started. I'm Jamie Pulfer. City News Time 903. Mining company Valet reports that over 30 of its 39 miners trapped underground at that mine near Sudbury are back on the surface now. The company says all are in good health. The remaining miners will be coming out in the next few minutes. A scoop bucket blocked the mine shaft, so workers had to use a system of ladders climbing approximately the height of two CN Towers to get out. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Inform your opinion. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Catastrophic failure. If you remember two words from today's show, I hope it's those two words. Catastrophic failure. That's what happened to LRT in Ottawa, August 8th, with the first derailment. The first of two derailments. Catastrophic failure. And they had no idea it even happened until they went to put the train cars back on the tracks. Catastrophic failure. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. What a day in the news business today, my friends. Everywhere you look, there's big news. And we are all over all the top stories of the day between now and noon here on the Rob Snow Show. Riley Brockington is going to get us started here this morning. He is the city councillor for River Ward. He is also a member of your Transit Commission, and he will offer up his reaction to this extraordinary letter that was released yesterday by the Transportation Safety Board. An early analysis into what went wrong during that first derailment of LRT back on the 8th of August. 
I read it yesterday. David called me. I was on my way home, and he said, Rob, you have got to read this letter. I'm reading this letter, Rob. I'm never riding light rail again after reading this letter. I'm sending it to you. I'm sending it to your email. You have to read it when you get home, and I read it when I got home, and then I read it again this morning. I mean, just eye-popping stuff in this letter. Failed wheels, burn marks on brake discs, roller bearing failures, and something called an axle journal burn-off. Axle journal burn-off. Now, I have no idea what that is, but I have a feeling it shouldn't be happening on what are basically brand new light rail vehicles. And you add it all together and what it amounts to, and this language is in this letter from the Transportation Safety Board to the City of Ottawa. It's in this letter time and time and time again. You know what it amounts to? Catastrophic failure. And among the many troubling things in this letter is that these trains have no way of alerting the operator that there could be a catastrophic failure of this type because there are no, what do you call them, detectors, sensors, heat warning devices, that a failure, a catastrophic failure, like this one, is about to happen. The operator won't know it's going to happen until it happens. And that's not all. If you want, I don't know, what do you call A shortcoming? Uh, an oversight? A design flaw? Whatever you want to call it, it was known that it was a shortcoming oversight design flaw. Many years ago, when these trains were selected, that the design of this particular light rail, rail vehicle would be problematic for just this reason. And it was suggested, hey, you might want to have some kind of warning system for that. But someone, somewhere along the way, decided against that in the belief routine maintenance would be able to catch any issues. Now, what did the city of Ottawa do with the routine maintenance of its light rail vehicles? It outsourced it to this consortium, right? Rideau Transit Group, and we know their track record. As Bob Shirelli said to me last week, it speaks for itself. And I guess we now know, because the Transportation Safety Board, God bless them, it said as much in this letter. Now we know that routine maintenance was not enough to catch this issue. Not enough to catch this issue until it was too late. And what happened? There was a, say it with me, David, catastrophic failure. And remember what they found. They found this problem, and then they said, well, we better go look at the rest of the trains. And what did they find? They found the same problem on nine more ra rail vehicles. And they had to pull the entire LRT out of service for five days. My gosh, ladies and gentlemen, my gosh. What? Have we gotten ourselves into here with these trains? Because then six weeks later, another derailment. Still under investigation, as is this one here as well. You know, I never thought I would be asking myself this. I thought it was more of a durability issue, you know. 
But this morning, I actually found myself asking myself, hey, I, I, am I risking my life by riding light rail in Ottawa? Should light rail come with warning signs at the, at the stations? Ride this train at your own risk. Sad. <laughs> Pathetic. Pathetic. The money spent, the years invested. Catastrophic failure. Remember those two words. They go together with another two words. Light rail. Also in the mix today, ongoing reaction to the return of the Canadian hostages. Michael Kovrig, Michael Spaver. And where the Canada-China relationship goes from here. We will dig into that issue with a pair of academics. First up, Ian Lee, the poor professor from the Glebe. With us every Tuesday morning and the China file top of mind for him today. There is an interesting case being made in the editorial in this morning's Globe and Mail, which notes that our current government, the Trudeau government, you know this, has long sought to have a closer economic relationship with China. It wants Canada to have closer economic ties with China. The advice in the Globe today is to slam the brakes on that and instead pursue closer ties with more democratic nations with more open economies like South Korea, like Japan, like India, and minimize is the word that's used in the Globe editorial, minimize our exposure, especially bilateral exposure to China. We'll get into that. And I think there's, uh, I think there's a big underreported story in Canada, energy prices. The European news media is already calling this the energy crisis, the energy crisis. It could be an expensive and painful winter. Oil prices rip-roaring along, $80 U.S. on the Brent price this morning. Oil prices are up 60% since the start of the year. Natural gas prices are the bigger story. They've doubled since the start of the year, tripled since this time last year. And there's a serious global shortage of natural gas Bloomberg News has a big write-up on it. Warning of a winter of blackouts and factory closures. Fuel shortage. Energy shortage. Energy crisis. Part of the story is climate-related. Because some fuel supplies from oil, natural gas, coal have been shuttered, curtailed, scaled back, because of the climate crisis. Replaced with renewables that are not up to the job. And now the politicians who made these decisions are praying for what? Mild winter weather. Get into that and go in-depth on the return of the two Michaels with Professor Elliot Tepper from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, one of the country's leading experts on the Canada-China relationship, usually here on Thursday. He's going to join us today instead because we don't have a show on Thursday. Thursday, we will mark the first national day for truth and reconciliation. We are going to discuss that today with Cindy Blackstone. She's here in Ottawa. She will be part of an event at Beechwood Cemetery on Thursday for the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. She'll explain what's going to happen there. I had a chance to speak with her this morning. She's a real thorn in the side of the federal government. She is keeping up the pressure. The pressure on the federal government to live up to its responsibilities especially when it comes to Indigenous child welfare. She's the executive director of First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. So don't miss that. Between 10 and 11 o'clock, it's always our talk back hour, phone calls, opinions this morning. I want to get back into this mess 
Uh, not just light rail. It's to me, it's the entire public transit file that's in disarray in this city. As I, 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 I as I explained yesterday, and our expert backed us up. See, when the train fails, and it's failed twice recently in spectacular fashion with near disastrous results. When the train fails, it has a cascading effect through the entire transit system. Replacement buses are forced into action, but we don't have enough spare buses, and we borrow Peter's bus so we can give Paul a ride to work. And for this, OC Transpo expects you to pay $122.50 a month. For a pass. I want to ask you this to get the question going, uh, to get the conversation going. I'll ask you this question. During the talkback hour, would you take public transit if you didn't need to? Let's say you had other options. There are people they don't have an option. OC Transpo is their ride. But let's say you're one of those lucky ones and you have options. You have your own car or you have a friend or family member who drives you where you need to go, or you can afford to take an Uber, you can afford to rent a car, or you have a nice bicycle. Would you give all that up and pay $122.50 and, and, and ride OC Transpo? Would you trade in your car keys for a Presto card? If you would, I would remind you of two words catastrophic failure. This is the Rob Snow Show on the City News. My name is Pamela Caillou. I'm a local artist. I'm C, and the heritage derives from Algonquin and Huron background that comes from way, way back from the 1600s. I was trained in school classically, like we studied the masters like Picasso, Michelangelo, Van Gogh. And so you'd have to say it's quite different, my style. What I've done is taken the skills that were taught to me tradition by traditional painting and incorporated that with the indigenous heritage. My art pieces uh, incorporate uh, the energy and spirit of the Mother Earth in pretty much every single one of them because I want people to realize, even though we might think we are the masters of the domain here on the planet, that is not the case. It's the Mother Earth that's providing a balance and, and our, our causes to live and whatnot. And uh, it's just uh, always, see her and remember her and respect her. Well, I try to keep my style different because there are like a handful of Canadian artists that are really are really well known, like uh, Norville Morriso and whatnot, but it's been done. So I kind of want to stay away from the pack and that's what makes my artwork a little more unique, but at the same time, if you're looking at it, you do know it's indigenous and you do know it's the woodland style. I usually start by uh, coming up with an idea, which would be, let's say four days, well, it depends what's inspiring me at the time. It could be a lot of trees, it could be water, it could be the medicine wheel. I would choose a subject and try to really incorporate what it is I want people to see from that. So then from there, I have sketchbooks and I do little sketches of everything because the canvas is expansive. <laughs> so you don't want to start something and have to throw it away. And then from there, I go on to the bigger piece on the canvas. Once I have on my sketches, the direction I want to take my artwork in. I chose a lot of vibrant colors for the pieces because I, if somebody is willing to make the commitment to have my piece of work in their home, I would actually like them to come home after a long, hard day, and some days aren't so great, to look at something that's very joyful.
of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. City Councilor Riley Brockington, Transit Commissioner. Back on the Rob Snow Show this morning. This is becoming habitual, Councilor Brockington. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Nice Thanks for hear, having nice me. Nice to hear from you. What is your reaction to the revelations contained in this letter to the city from the Transportation Safety Board? Well, it's very disturbing. As I said last week on your show, I do not understand how axle or wheels can come off a train and a conductor or the driver, the operator of the the train is not made aware. There's no type of signal, alarm, stop immediately, emergency switch that stops the train uh, in it, literally in its tracks for overall safety. Obviously, we need to understand why that's the case. I think we have to understand what is heat detection equipment <laughs> that the city passed on, what purpose does it serve, what was the cost-benefit analysis of, of deciding not to go ahead with, with this equipment, obviously. Now, was any done? Was any right. done? Right. That's right. right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Not my area of expertise, but these are the types of sort of uh, global questions that the Transit Commission needs a better understanding of. Um, and how long, I think the million dollar question for the people of Ottawa is how long is this going to take before the system is up and running? Uh, as you just said, prior to going to commercial break, um, when the LRT goes down, it's felt across the entire city, every neighborhood. We don't have the bus capacity to fully no. replace the line when it goes down, and so OC Transpo has to do what they've done. They're shaving routes uh, from local routes across the city to make up for it, and so people have to wait longer, and, and generally the, the system is, is weaker because of it. So I'm disappointed. Yeah, it's the erosion of faith, of confidence in the system as well. Um, this, for this to be viable, uh, given, given the investment, the time, uh, for this to be a, a viable project for the city, it has to be reliable. Of People course. need to be able to rely on it. If I if I uh, work in Orleans or uh, if I live in Orleans and I work at Tunney's Pasture, I need to know that that this is a system that's actually going to get me to my workplace. Or you know, I'll, I'll suffer through rush hour on the 174 <laughs> at least i know i'll get to work right yeah, councillor the, brockington the number yeah. one factor that brings people to your transit system believe it or not is not the cost of the fare it's reliability they need to be able passengers need to be able to plan their schedules daily schedules getting to work getting to appointments social activities getting home on time to pick up their kids uh, on reliability, on a system that's going to be there when we post a schedule and, and say it's going to come, either bus or train. And when people can't do that, they start to review their options for getting to where they need to go. They'll do the, the financial analysis and say, all right, it's maybe a little bit more, but at least I know I'm going to get there. Precisely. And my big frustration is we put the people of Ottawa through hell for years to build LRT. The bus system was stretched to the max, significant detours. It was extremely painful. We told people the LRT was going to be the savior, that this was the silver bullet to help with uh, public transit in the system. We know that there, there's going to be challenges between uh, when LRT phase one opened and when LRT phase two opens because, um, you know, the system isn't the entire stretch of the city yet. But that hasn't happened. That reliability hasn't happened. Rob, don't be fooled by these quotes from OC Transville that says, oh, we're running 98% of the time. What are you complaining about? I think that is beyond disingenuous for OC Transpo to say that to the people of Ottawa when they've continued to struggle with so many different components of the LRT. We, we can go through the list, the cannery system, the brakes, the switches, the doors, the axles, the wheels. It's this um, unreliable, uh, inconsistent service delivery that's gotten people so upset. And so, yeah, it might work fine at 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, but when people need to take the system, it has not consistently been there, and that's why people are so upset. Okay, I have a memo here from Steve Canalacos, the city manager. This uh, arrived in our inbox here at City News uh, uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. 
I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, I'll quote from it. I believe the confidence and integrity of the uh, uh, of the safety of our light rail system is paramount and that enhancing public trust in that system is and must be as much of a priority for considerations of confidence and integrity as LRT operations. It goes on. In light of this, I have made the decision not to retain STV as the independent safety expert. I advise STV of this yesterday and they support this decision. What is your reaction to that news from the city manager? It's the right decision. Um, There were certainly some eyebrows raised when people did some basic research and found out that STV was engaged in phase one to begin with in in numerous, uh, you know, facets or capabilities. And uh, when the city manager announced an independent review was going to take place, um, you can't really invite a company that was involved in phase one to begin with. So it's the right decision. Uh, I, I do agree that uh, the pool of, of qualified uh, companies to go to is, is small, so it's probably challenging to, to get a company to come in and do that who has the time to do that. So I'll, I'll grant that to the city manager, but we want the public to uh, feel confident that the system is safe and that it was assessed by an independent source. And so this is the right move for sure. Okay. Councillor Brockington, thank you for your time again this morning. Thanks, Rob. My pleasure. Uh, Bye-bye. That is Councillor Riley Brockington. He represents River Ward and he sits on the city's transit commission. Coming up right after the 930 News... It's the poor professor from the Glebe and his weekly take on the big news stories of the day. Ian Lee from Carleton University. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, September 28th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 10 degrees, Smith Falls 9. Here's what's making news this hour. The city manager says Ottawa will not use a company it previously said would review safety of the LRT. STV was previously used as a consultant, though, on this project, so to keep trust in the process. City Manager Steve Canalac has decided not to use them for this review. They've been informed yesterday. He says a pool of experts to draw from for this review, though, is small. 
Once a decision is made, City Council will be notified. Transportation Safety Board looking into the train derailments on the LRT says the city should have used a heat warning system that would have warned of problems before the derailment that happened back on August 8th. The TSB also continues to look at the derailment from September 19th. The rest of the miners who were trapped underground at the Totten mine outside Sudbury should be on the surface this morning. 39 miners altogether were trapped when a bucket broke off and blocked the shaft on Sunday. Miners had to climb a series of ladders about the length of two CN towers just to get back to the surface. Ontario Science Advisory Table set to release new COVID-19 projections today. The daily case count so far has remained under 1,000 during this fourth wave. Now that's well below the worst case scenario in the previous modeling number. That showed about 4,000 daily cases by now in the worst scenario. City News Time at 9.32. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Professor of Management, Carleton University, Ian Lee. Back on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. So look, fabulous news. The two Michaels are home. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I, I, lo- I've been saying for three years since it happened that I thought it was an, it was inevitable that it would happen, and that it was going to be a political solution, not. Uh, a rule of law solution, and I'm not against rule of law, of course not, but I think there were a significant number, I mean, there was a debate uh, in the media, there were a lot of op-eds on both sides, and there was one side very uh, adamantly argued we shouldn't, there shouldn't be any political solution or political negotiations, but this was political from the get-go. Um, the uh, and I'm not trying to take China's side in this at all because they're not a rule of law country, but uh, the, you know the, she was arrested because the U.S. government wanted to send a message. Uh, this was under Trump and wanted to send a message to Iran um, because she was accused of uh, violating the uh, embargo on trading with Iran, and they wanted to send a message to China. So it was the the legal process. It was political politicized from the jump. From the get-go, that does not, in any way, shape, or form, exonerate or legitimize China's um, kidnapping, illegal kidnapping of two innocent Canadians, uh, demonstrating that China is not a rule of law country. But the point is, it was political from the get-go, and I kept quoting Henry Kissinger, you know, saying that, um, you know, that this is about interests. Nations have interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, not friends or allies uh, or enemies, but interests. And it was going to require a political solution, I argue, because it was in the strategic interest right. of the U.S., yeah. Canada, and China. And clearly, Biden intervened, even though, and in fact, Bob Fife and the Globe and Mail is reporting that off the record from people in the, in the PMO. In Was- no, well, in Washington, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I mean, even though there's all three countries are officially saying, nope, nothing to do with politics at all, yes, we have no bananas. For sure. Of course it was political. Of course they negotiated it politically. Apparently Biden was personally involved. Xi was personally involved in this, in signing off and releasing the two Michaels. And I, this is not a victory for Mr. Trudeau, meaning he didn't arrange it. He didn't negotiate it. He didn't consummate it. He owes a huge, huge IOU to Joe Biden. And the only question is, I would love to have heard that conversation. What did he promise Mr. Biden as compensation, basically, for the IOU? Okay. Um, Let me ask you a personal question, because you have been teaching uh, usually on an annual basis in China, right? For how many years? 20-some years. 1997. 1997. Wow. Okay. Um, Given what has happened over the last almost three years with the two Michaels, um, has that given you um, pause? Have you rethought uh, the idea of going over there at all? No, or you no haven't. not at all. Not you, at you all. Ha- you're, not, you're not in fear of being no, 
accused of being all. a spy or anything no, like that. No, not at all. And, you know, I don't want to go to the other extreme and say, you know, China is, uh, hates everybody from outside of China. That's simply not true. Um, as the Globe and Mail uh, editorial today, which is an excellent editorial, pointed out, yeah, we'll get into this it. is a very <laughs> strange, when I say strange relationship, if we take the old Cold War relationship between the Soviet Union and, and the West as the model where they were, they were strict, there was no supply chain interactions, you know, the West didn't trade with the Soviet bloc, the Soviet bloc didn't trade with the West, and there was, there was an iron curtain. There was no movement of people and goods and services across those, that iron curtain. They were two side-by-side uh, -side blocks. That's not the case with China before this hostage taking by China. It is not the case now, and it won't be the case in the future. We're deeply implicated with each other, and that's going to continue, although it's going to change. And, and so I, I don't, I'm not worried. Uh, first off, they, they seized the two Michaels because we arrested and retained uh, Ms. Meng, the CFO of Huawei. That's exactly why they did it. It had nothing to do with the rule of law. Well, Ms. Meng is now to jail. <laughs> She's back in China. So uh, there's Canadians that are going over there now, and there have been during that three-year period. I, I, don't, I won't, don't want anyone to think that, you know, if you walk off the plane in China, they're going to arrest you and throw you in jail for three years. That is simply not the case. This was a unique situation where uh, the, the one of the star corporations of China, it's the chosen instrument of China, and I'm talking Huawei, which is probably why we have to ban it, by the way, uh, because they're so deeply implicated with the Communist Party. And she was the CFO and the daughter of the entrepreneur founder of Huawei. You know, it's like kidnapping, I don't know, President Biden's daughter, if he has a daughter, or some other president's daughter. Probably not. You know, Steve, a, a Jobs, thing to do. Steve Jobs' daughter, or somebody, yeah, Jeff Bezos' you know, or daughter. Or Stephen Jobs' daughter, or Michael <laughs> Bill Gates' daughter. Yeah. I mean, this was, I mean, it was so political from the beginning. And. And, and so it was in, I, I'm, again, I'm not rationalizing what China did. What China did was absolutely wrong. And, and it shows that we have to tread very, very carefully with our eyes wide open, not, as Mr. Trudeau has been doing for five years, eyes wide shut. And that's not unfair to say that. It was Mr. Trudeau who five years ago said he had a lot of admiration for the Chinese governance, the Chinese system, and the Chinese way of doing business, and the Chinese governance model. Well, we now know Mr. Trudeau was flat out wrong, empirically. And we know that from the experience of the last three years. This is not a rule of law country. We must continue to do business with China in a different way because it is the second largest economy in the world, and it's not going to go away. It's not going to vanish because we pretend it's not there. And it is the one of the oldest civilizations in the world. And so it just means that we're going to have to be much more careful. We can continue to trade, even increase, I hope, agricultural exports, timber exports, oil and gas, liquefied natural gas, but we will not be able to trade uh, or uh, engage in a, a trade okay. either way All right. with, negotiate, with sophisticated products like the Huawei type of products. You mentioned this editorial in the Globe and Mail this morning. I'm going to read um, a couple of lines from it here. Quote, it was only a few years ago that the Trudeau government's goal was closer economic integration with China. It is now clear that Canadian foreign policy must lean in the opposite direction yeah. so that the growth of trade and investment ties with China is not maximized, as Beijing would wish, but rather minimized for the protection of Canada's independence. Canada should be seeking an economic relationship with China that as much as possible is regulated through multilateral forums and it should and it should aim to be no trade dependent on china than absolutely necessary ties to japan south korea india and others must be bolstered with an eye to limiting the relative size of the china connection what do you think of that i agree and disagree there's two separate arguments there all right um, uh, and I don't think it's as uh, black and white as they're saying. As I've said already, and I'll say it again, uh, I think we will continue to trade. We ought to continue to trade with, let's call it routine stuff. Let's call it more simplistically low-tech stuff. And, and with the uh, apologies to farmers in advance, I'm not putting them down, I, I don't think that anyone would suggest that uh, sending over wheat or barley 
is in the same category as tr uh, trading uh, sophisticated uh, semiconductor chips or artificial intelligence software. Uh, so we can continue to trade, you know, seafood and uh, and resources and timber and oil and gas and molybdenum and potash and whatever, right. you know, agricultural products, sure. uh, natural resource products. Sure, we have they're lots of it. It's very good for critical, our economy. Yep. They're not critical to national security. And they do help our farmers and China. Well, I would say food, fuel, and fertilizer are pretty important to national security, Professor. I, I don't agree. You. You don't uh, agree. Uh, no, okay. they're commodities. They're generic commodities on the world market. Oh, well, well. Now, uh, of course, energy is important. Maybe, maybe that's a Canadian view because we have it in such abundance. If you don't Rob, have much of Rob, it at all, no um, secret molecules and oil. Okay, there is secrets, national proprietary secrets in advanced semiconductor chips that can do amazing things, artificial intelligence. There's no secret molecules in oil. West Texas Intermediate oil is the same everywhere in the world, whether it's used by China or Germany or Canada or the U.S. And it's just they need it for sure. They need energy. I'm not disputing that, but it's not uh, critical. Trump never suggested banning oil exports or uh, liquefied natural natural gas to China. He was right, right, right. talking about cutting off high-tech trade, sophisticated products with China. That's where I think the issue is, and the okay. globe didn't make that distinction. They just said, minimize all trade with China. Well, that would mean minimizing oil, uh, uh, wheat exports or barley. Well, what's the benefit to Canada of limiting uh, the exports of uh, uh, beef or, or, or poultry to China? There's no benefit. Whereas, so, so yes, we should diversify our trade. We don't want all our eggs in one basket to that cliche, right. but uh, we that doesn't mean that we cannot do business with China, but we can't do business with China with sophisticated stuff. Well, see, and this is this is kind of the evolution of, of the trade conversation in Canada since, say, the big free trade debates. Um, and the and and I think about the Team Canada missions to China, right. and, uh, China was the original pivot, <laughs> China right. was supposed to be trade diversification because. Prior to China, we, we and and we still are so heavily reliant on our main customer, which is the United States. China was supposed to be the path toward right. diversification, and now we're searching for another pivot. Uh, right? You're, Wouldn't you're you right. say? You've yeah. summarized, yeah. Rob. You've summarized that very nicely. Let me say I, I've strongly disagreed with the liberals on that argument that goes all the way back to Pierre Elliott Trudeau when he talked about the third way. He said we're too dependent on the United States. And when you think about it, from it sounds really wonderful, and everybody says, yeah, 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 it's, we're too dependent. Think about that for one moment. We have eight thousand five hundred kilometers of common border. Ninety percent of Canadians live within, live within 150 kilometers of the U.S. border. They speak mostly the same language that we mostly speak. Yes, I know French and Quebec, but we're an English-speaking country. They're an English-speaking country. They're a rule of law country. We're a rule of law country. We use English common law from the Brits, so do the Americans. The similarities between our cultures. Sure, there's important differences, but there's enormous similarities, and they're right next door. And so the liberals were promoting this fantasy fantasy, delusional fantasy, that we could move 10,000 or 15,000 kilometers away, halfway around the world, to a culture that does not speak English and we don't speak Mandarin. And we were going to displace the U.S. relationship. This was delusional from the jump, from the get-go. Diversif diversification, maybe. I mean, a little bit less trade with the U.S., maybe a little bit more with other countries. Yes, Trans-Pacific Partnership. But the idea that we were going to pivot from the U.S. to China was nonsensical on every imaginable dimension, whether it made sense, whether it was, it was an economic logic, whether it was a political logic. I mean, it just never made sense from the beginning. And I've been to China since 1997. It's a wonderful country. But don't kid yourself. It's not the U.S. or Canada. It's a very, very, very different culture, different legal system, different language, different culture, different history. And, and as I said, it was delusional of the liberal elites to believe that we could pivot to China and make it, uh, if not as important as the U.S., a, a very, very significant player. It was, it was never destined to be, especially because they have their own goals. The Chinese Communist Party has their goal of world dominance. And, and they see us as a, a strong partner, accurately, of the United States. So their whole premise 
of their plan was flawed from the very, very beginning. And the Globe is absolutely right in their editorial. Now they're going to have to do a major rethink in the PMO and in the government, and I think they're going to have to bring in some outsiders because there's pro- that view is probably still there. Mr. Trudeau still won't condemn China on certain critical issues. So they're going to have to bring in some outsiders to give fresh ideas, fresh thinking, because they're not, they don't seem to have that capacity okay. inside the PMO. All right, when we come back, could it be an expensive winter? Professor Ian Lee is with us here, Sprout School of Business at Carleton University. This is the Rob Stowe Show on City News. Papa Jack was started uh, 14 years ago, really by accident, more than anything. Uh, A friend of mine had bought a grocery store, a popcorn machine was in there, he didn't want it, I ended up by buying it. My family thought I was nuts. When I first said, come and pick up this popcorn machine, uh, my son said, what the heck for? Uh, I won't use the exact words. But anyway, uh, we started and it just kept on growing and growing. Um, but at the time, I was the only one selling popcorn in Ottawa. But we persever- persevered as a family, and here we are. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding uh, for my family and myself. And to see our brand name, Papa Jack, and Papa Jack came out of, I wanted something that was going to be very bilingual. So Pepe, and then in Ontario, everybody called me Jack, even though my name is Jacques. In, Ke- in Quebec, it's fine, it's Jacques, but in Ontario, it was always Jack. So we married the two together, Pepe, Jack. With the store that we have on Thurston Drive, um, it basically, the factory's in the back. If you come in to the store, you can see how the popcorn is being made during the week. So it adds an, an extra uh, layer of, you can see the sanitation, you can see how we do it. Um, it's not like making popcorn. Most people thought when I started this, I was making popcorn in my garage or in my basement. Uh, no, never did. Uh, it was started in this building, in the back of the building, and then we kept growing and growing until what we have now. My daughter and my son came up with a brilliant idea to do a fundraiser online. So basically all people have to do is to register here and we give them a special code number. And with that code number, they tell their friends, or their neighbors, everybody to buy online from us with that code number, and then at the end of each period, could be two weeks, could be a month, then we'll pay them a 20% of all the businesses that we got through that code number. One thing I'd like to say and is thank you to all the Ottawa people who have supported us and support local businesses. It, um, sometimes people, you know, they, uh, they talk about buying um, locally. Um, now it becomes that much more, um, important to buy locally to support your local businesses because not too many of them are going to survive this. We're fortunate that we're so far so good. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Back with Professor Ian Lee, Sprout School of Business, Carleton University. Let me read you a little bit from this story. This is from Bloomberg, Bloomberg News. This winter, the world will be fighting over something that's invisible yet rarely so vital and in alarmingly shorter supply. Nations are more reliant than ever on natural gas to heat homes and power industries amid efforts to quit coal and increase the use of cleaner energy sources. But there isn't enough gas to fuel the post-pandemic recovery and refill depleted stocks before the cold months. Countries are trying to outbid one another for supplies as exporters such as Russia move to keep more natural gas at home. The crunch will get a lot worse when temperatures drop. The crisis in Europe presages trouble 
for the rest of the planet as the continent's energy shortage has governments warning of blackouts and factories being forced to shut. Should we brace for a painful and expensive winter? What is your opinion, Professor Ian Lee? Uh, as you know or will remember, Rob, I've been talking about this very issue. I don't mean shortages in Europe, but the idea that the alternative energies, renewable energies, are have systems have not yet been built. They're not fully there. We cannot literally flick a switch and everybody heat their homes with electric heat, every hospital, every school across Canada. I've been talking about this for months on end because I'm doing a study for McDonald Laurie Institute on the cost of decarbonization. I've been on Amanda Lang on BNN on this and, and other media, and I've argued that you should never disconnect the old system before you have the new system up and running. And that that's what we've been doing, though. That's what governments that around the world have been doing. Yeah. Environmental activists trying to shut down pipelines and refineries and oil sands. What they're doing, and they're doing it very self-consciously, is trying to create energy poverty, energy crisis. And I keep arguing over and over. I don't know if they're trying to create well, energy are, poverty, but, the but uh, um, the you know. Of <laughs> shutting it down is that you cannot heat your home with natural gas. I don't know if it's, a, you know, you, you're, you're saying it's intentional. Maybe it's an unintended consequence. Maybe. Uh, Rob, Rob, if you try and shut down the pipelines and you try and shut down the resort, the refineries, and you try and shut down oil and gas uh, production, what is the purpose of oh, that? it's all with so the best of intentions. So. No. Okay, all right. What do you use that for? For fun? No, you use it to heat your home in the sure, winter when sure, it's minus sure. 25. Yes, The yes, purpose yes, yes, of yes. this, of these activists, is to stop us from using using these energy sources that are fossil fuels. But we don't use them for fun. You don't say, gee whiz, I'm going to put the heat on because oh, I get so much fun turning on the furnace in my house. You put it on because it's minus 25 outside, and if you don't, your pipes will freeze. You put gas in your car to drive to the grocery store to buy groceries at minus 10 and to feed your family. In other words, it's an essential. It's something we do because it's absolutely essential. It's not it's something we do for fun. And the environmental activists that are trying to shut this down, shut down various supplies of fossil fuel, Line 5 in Michigan uh, or, or Keystone, they're trying to stop people from using fossil fuels. That's the purpose of the exercise. And so this crisis, and I don't welcome it, I'm not saying that this is good news, but it's going to give us a taste of where they're going to go, where they want to take us. And people are going to find out how brutal this is. Because if you can't drive your car because there's no gas in the pumps, or you can't heat your house, this is not funny. This is not, uh, oh, well, you know, they're just protesters. You know, they have the right to protest. This is existential. And I am going to go further, Rob, and I don't advocate it. I'm not advocating any, but I'm saying if you start frightening people and they don't think that they can heat their home or get to the grocery store to buy groceries, they're going to, it's going to get very, oh, yeah. very ugly. And I don't well, I mean, there are reports that in the UK now, uh, there's no fuel shortage in the UK, but there's a driver shortage in the UK. People yeah. to, to, to actually from the oil terminal to get it to the gas station, they don't have enough truck drivers. They have a right. labor shortage there. Right. So, I mean, uh, but the, 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 it has set people off and they the panicked buying into yes. panicked buying. And now it's something like a third of gas stations across the UK. They have no right. gas. And they're t it's going to get much worse that the forecasters are predicting that there's going to be serious shortages, shortages of natural yeah. gas in china there there was a wonderful article just today in the telegraph by ambrose evans pritchard the world economic editor and he said parts of china as of today we're talking september 2021 are actually shutting down parts of the economy cement production has been ordered to dial back because they've only got 18 days of coal for the whole country and and coal is is their single most important power source they're short of liquefied natural gas they're short of oil and and so they're shutting down parts of the economy in China. That's how Syria, and they're the second largest economy in the world, and they're driving up the prices because they're trying to, well, what happens always when there's a shortage, you bid up the price because you say, I want that uh, gas out, that LNG out there, and they're bidding against Europe for uh, any extra LNG that's out there. So there's going to be shortages. I'm not saying it's going to happen in Canada. I'm saying there's going to be shortages probably
especially in Europe. There's already shortages now in China. People are going to suffer big time. And now we're going to see what happens when we do prematurely shut down supply of fossil fuels before we create an alternative energy system to displace and replace fossil fuels. I've argued, Mm -hmm. yes, decarbonization, but we've got to build the alternative system, build the grid first so it's capable of delivering the green uh, alternative renewable energy to people before we disconnect the pipelines, before we disconnect the gas furnaces and the oil furnaces and the propane furnaces. And that is why I've argued over and over, environmental activists are acting in a socially irresponsible manner. And if there are ultimate losses, I am absolutely not, I mean, harm to humans. I'm not advocating violence. I hope that some people decide to sue the environmental groups in a class action suit <laughs> okay. and take them to right. court and sue them for everything yeah, they've got that. for imposing. Hey, look, at least no, look, if, if gas prices go through the roof, you know, maybe people will give up their car keys and they, they can always take light rail. I mean, look, look. At, oh, wait. Oh, yeah, wait. We're going to make yeah, those yeah. little old ladies <laughs> at 80 years old walk four <laughs> no. kilometers no, no, to no. laws in minus 25 with their paper bags. Yeah, it's a great idea. Light rail's not running, Professor. That's that's the joke. That's the joke. How about we bike? We'll bike down the we'll bike, bike lane. I'll give you a piggyback, Professor. Listen, I can give you a piggyback. bike lanes are pristine in the winter. They're oh, the only yes, they are. They keep those clean, don't they? They sure do. Yes, they, they do. do. Oh, boy. We're in an awful mess with light rail, though. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um, and what do you do out in Kadata? I'm being very serious now, okay? The light rail runs from the burbs into the downtown, uh, hub and spoke. But what do you do well, if you're one the, part you know, of the you consider, If you consider a, Blair, I don't consider Blair Road. Road to be the burbs. Tunney's Pasture is not the burbs anymore. No, but what I'm trying to um, say is, you, you're missing yeah. my point. My point is that they don't run, light rail doesn't run across the burbs. It no. runs from the burbs to the downtown. Yes. What if you're not going downtown? What if you're trying well, to go from it. one part of the Canada to another part of Canada? Oh, it's the terrible. Light rail doesn't run across no, the burbs. No, it doesn't. No. No. And have has the Councillor bus Menard is, thought about that, or yeah. Councillor Lippert, or the mayor, when they tell us we've all got to start taking trips on light rail? Well, what if I'm not going? I'm in the Glebe. What if I want to go three kilometers to Loblaws at Billing at, at the Pretoria Bridge? There's no light rail running down Bank Street. It doesn't run down the canal. Oh, no, but you've got by. the number seven that goes down there. So. <laughs> All right, and, and look, I've got to run. I've got to run here, but okay. uh, well, we're just getting carried away. It's nice to hear from you. We'll talk next My week. Pleasure. Okay, fight the good fight. Bye bye, right. uh, Professor Ian Lee, Sprout School of Business, Carleton University. But I want to ask you about light rail. There are people in the city. A lot of people. They don't have the option. They rely on OC transport. They rely on public transit. It's their only option. For you, if you have options, you have your own vehicle. You have a friend or family, they have a vehicle. They can take you where you need to go. You can afford to Uber it here, there, or everywhere. Rent a car if you need to. Would you give all of that up to opt for OC Transpo and light rail? That's the topic of conversation during the Talk Back Hour. Next, 750-1310 Rob Snow Show. City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, September 28th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 10 degrees, Smith Falls 9, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. The firm chosen to conduct the independent safety review of the LRT system will not be conducting that review after all. On Friday, the city announced the firm STV would be hired to conduct this third-party review, which has been shut down that LRT system after two derailments in six weeks. Critics suggested their review would not be fully independent since they did consult during construction of the LRT. Today, City Manager Steve Kanalakos cited public trust and perception issues, saying STV would no longer be retained as the safety expert. Councillor Riley Brockington tells City News that was the right decision. When the city manager announced an independent review was going to take place, um, you can't really invite a company that was involved in phase one to begin with. So it's the right decision. The city is now on the search for a new independent firm. Brockington admits the pool of candidates, though, is rather slim. City News Time 1002. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Most areas should have a fair amount of sunshine today. The high just 16 degrees. And that's average though. A few clouds tonight near 7 and tomorrow mainly cloudy with the high about 14 degrees. For today the high 16. And right now it's 10 degrees in Ottawa. It's 9 degrees in Smith Falls. Ontario Science Advisory Table set to release the new COVID-19 projections today. New modeling is set is going to be posted online at 2 this afternoon. The weekly briefing, though, from the Chief Medical Officer of Health that normally happens on Tuesdays at 3 in the afternoon has been rescheduled now to tomorrow. Ontario's daily case count has remained uh, uh, under 1,000 during this fourth wave. The graph of Ontario's seven-day average roughly shows a plateau since the start of September. That is well under the worst-case scenario of some 4,000 cases a day. A rescue operation for 39 miners trapped underground in northern Ontario over the weekend should wrap up this morning. The company says employees were trapped in the Totten mine west of Sudbury on Sunday, a scoop bucket being uh, used to send uh, underground detached and blocked the mine shaft. So the system for taking workers to and from the service, uh, surface became unavailable. They had to use a ladder system to climb approximately the height of two CN towers in order to get to the surface. City News Time 1003, the OPEC cartel is laying out the future of oil, and it says crude will still be the world's leading source of energy for decades to come. The Vienna-based organization said it inherently supports the effort to reduce the amount of carbon from fossil fuels used, but it says energy use in rich countries will likely decline due to increasing efficiency, lower growth, and an aging population. But growing populations and new middle classes in the rest of the world will demand more energy. It cautions that government's ambitious plans to reduce fossil fuel emissions remain just that. Plans. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. There are lots of people in Ottawa. They don't have a, an option other than to use OC Transpo to get around the city. It's the only option they have. They don't have cars. But would you opt for OC Transpo if you if you did have other options? You know, would you trade in your car keys for a Presto card? I wonder, given the news about light rail, if people are trading in Presto cards for car keys. But what if you had other options? You know, there are lots of other Uber, friends and family, uh, bicycle. Would you use OC Transpo even if you didn't have to? 750-1310, 750-1310, Would you use public transit if you didn't need to? That's the question here during the talkback hour. Would you use public transit if you didn't need to? If you had another option, options like owning your own vehicle or having a, a family member or friend take you where you need to go. Ride sharing apps, Uber, Lyft, Blue Line. 
all kinds of options for all kinds of people. If you have all those options, would you opt out of those and opt in to public transit? Now, you might say, well, you know, Rob, that's a loaded question. Yeah, okay, I'll give you that. It's kind of a loaded question. Because the stats would say in this city, the vast majority of people do not take public transit to begin with. I guess I just want to get the conversation going. And what I really want to get it, it get at is, is the why. Why? If your answer is, uh, uh, no, Rob, and you're crazy, I wouldn't use public transit. I have my own car. I want to know why you wouldn't opt for public transit. Many members of the city council are under the impression that the lure of, of light rail is, is so strong that you won't be able to resist leaving your car in the driveway and getting on that, that, that shiny train. Well, that was the lure. That was, that was supposed to be the lure, <laughs> right? But if the answer is no, I like things just the way they are right now. I have no interest of, um, you know, switching to the bus or a light rail train. I want to know why that is. Is it because of uh, travel times? Is it because of cost? Is it because of reliability issues with light rail? Is it because of COVID issues? Don't want to share a public transit vehicle with uh, a dozen other people because uh, you're worried about COVID-19. I have to ask. Safety concerns outside of public health. Safety concerns thrust to the forefront now because of these derailments. So, I mean, it's kind of framed as a yes or no question, but it's, you know, again, it's really about the why. Because I do anticipate that most of you will answer, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to take public transit. I have all of these other options, okay, other than, other than public transit. 750-1310, 750-1310, Dan uh, in Lowertown. Lower Town. Good morning. Up first during the talkback hour here on City News. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi, Dan. So let's say you have all kinds of options on how to get around the city. Would would you opt and decide to take OC Transpo? No, personally, no. To, to answer your question quickly, for, for me, it's a, it's a time management issue. I mean, I, I'm working from home now, but when I when I was commuting every day, you know, it, it was about a 10-minute drive for me, even in rush hour. Okay, okay. Whereas if I took OC Transpo, it would be, you know, almost an hour each way so a 10 minute drive or an hour on public transit wow holy yeah, smokes yeah. So Inclu did that it must yeah. have included a transfer you must have had the transfer did no you? no it was oh, all really? the stops you know all the stops oh i see and, just and kind of a milk through. run kind of thing I guess. yeah yeah right so that, that's my but my other point is i uh, like i said uh, I, you mentioned the number seven bus uh, it, it goes by my my house uh, oh yeah 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 okay. most of them but uh, I'm not sure if that bus runs 24-7, but it runs very late at, at night. Like, I see it go by, like, at 2 a.m. if I'm still up sometimes, and it's, it's always empty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always an articulated bus, you know, like, the whole, the whole my house and my neighbor's house is all, all rumble, and it seems to be all for nothing because there's nobody on the bus. Oh, really? Okay, still. So I, okay. I don't know if, if, it's, if there are other routes in the city like that, but... Well, you know, ridership, uh, the last update we had at the last Transit Commission was, you know, ridership kind of bottomed out at like 10, 20 percent. Uh, it's back up to 34 percent now. So meaning 65 plus percent of the riders have not returned to OC Transpo. So. But just, just from a fiscal management point, I mean, it makes no yeah. sense to be running these, these articulated buses. Hey, look, I, I've, I've put that to councillors. I've put that to the mayor. I've put that to the head of the Amalgamated Transit Union. And you know what they tell me? We, we're not, we can't get rid of any of these bus routes and we can't let go of any bus drivers. It's, um, it's actually good because it allows people to space out on the bus, you know, to socially distance on the bus. Uh, and I guess, Dan, by the sounds of things, socially distance, yeah, it's going to be you and the bus driver on an articulated bus, right? <laughs> and compare that to, compare that to Voyager bus, like, what, oh, yeah. been by Voyager, the bus terminal is gone, right? They're, they're oh, yeah, it's gone. gone. Yeah, yeah, gone, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Soon to be a condo it's tower. Yeah, it's subsidized. It just keeps running and running, and and, and yeah. nobody's on it. That's and right. It just keeps keeps going. Yep. And Voyager is going to be a condo tower. That's right. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. Yep. But I mean, my question is: Let's say you, you have a vehicle, or let's say you do well enough, you can afford. If you really need the use of a private vehicle, you can hail an Uber. You can hail a cab, or um. You have a kind relative and they can drive you around, or you have a generous friend, they'll, they'll drive you where you need to go. Would you instead, be, and before all of those, spend $122.50 a month and buy a monthly transit pass? I almost said bus pass, they, but that's how old I am. Transit pass presto card. Joanne in Orleans. Joanne. Good morning. Morning, Joanne. I, um, first of all, I can't use public transit from my house. Uh, they have gutted the bus system over the last 20 years, I suppose, in anticipation of paying for the train. Um, and what used to be a very, very smooth, easy ride, uh, harkening back to the days of, you know, Andy Hayden, it, it doesn't exist anymore. My kids used to be able to get from Orleans to Ottawa U in half an hour. Uh, it's a nightmare now. So any use of public right, how long does it take to get? How long does it take to get from Ottawa U to Orleans now? Well, uh, with the train now, uh, right. but prior to that, it, it you know that transition from no train to gutted service. Okay. It was an hour. Uh, and now it's even longer. Well, now you have a transfer. There's stuff. a transfer now, too, right? Well, so, and yeah. then when you got the train involved, it was a, it was a nightmare. Right. A nightmare okay. disaster. Uh, a very unpleasant situation, to put it mildly. Okay. Um, so, so for me, where we live, there's zero appeal. Um, and I wouldn't use it without also using my car. The notion of a park and ride is exactly how Ian Lee described, the idea of within a suburb getting somewhere. So for us to get to the bus station, it's just not worth the aggravation. Sorry, to the train station. It's not worth the aggravation. We would do it with our vehicle. Then perhaps spend an afternoon on the market having jumped on the train. But that's only because I live in Orleans. I wouldn't do it if I lived in Barhaven or Canada. It would be ridiculous. It would take all the pleasure out of it. And what disturbs me is, is the idea that they can continue to design the city in such a way that they are slowly eliminating all the infrastructure. We, and when we're talking infrastructure, we're talking about a permanent design. And, and they're, it's flawed. There is not enough parking. They're not building buildings with enough parking. They're not building enough uh, condos, uh, commerce. Uh, even the park and rides. And it isn't in keeping with, I think, the desire of the public. We like our cars. We want our cars. COVID has had us fall in love again with our cars. And I know you corrected me with stats. I still maintain, though, <laughs> I don't know who they asked. A mark of a Oh, well, young people getting, getting driver's license? Uh, no, in fact, yeah, more and more young people now. Uh, there's been a big culture shift in people getting driver's license. I know but, people in their 20s have never learned to drive a car. Yes, yes. But you know what? I would ask, there should have been a second or third question. Right. Do you still live at home? Do you well, know someone close to you who drives you? Okay. Can you borrow a car? Because I find the people who are all, you know, up yeah, in your face but, about this, they, yeah. they are using a car. It's someone else's. And I know personally, anecdotally, people I know who don't own a car can't afford a car. Well, yet. maybe, 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 Joanne. Do We're getting, getting a little off base, getting a little off base, getting a little off. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, David is closer to that cohort than I am. Um, you know people, they've never learned to drive, never gone for a driver's test, never tried to get a driver's license you do I, you do know people like that, offhand right? i could name three if you gave me an hour i could come up with a list certainly really yeah, really? yeah. Yep. that's a culture shift oh yeah whereas yeah. it used to be i'm 16 take me to the driver's exam yeah like i can't get my driver's license fast enough it's predominantly people who grew up 
spitting distance to a major transit station. Right. They just never needed to learn. Needed to. Okay. All right. We'll be right back. I have to, I want to walk you through what this transportation safety board letter says, but I don't want to get away from kind of the key question because in order for this project to be really worth the time, the effort, the investment, the money spent, they need people who are going to say, I'm going to leave my car in my driveway this morning and I am going to take OC Transpo instead. OC Transpo is going to become my preferred method of getting around the city. Are you one of those people? 750-1310, Rob Snow Show on City News. So Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Center has been around since 1982 and it's here to serve residents um, of Ward 13. Um, so our focus is on um, helping to reduce uh, poverty in this community as well as empowering uh, residents to find uh, resilience within themselves. Um, so one of the, the new focuses of our center is around food programming. Um, so you'll notice today when we, when we go around on a little tour um, that we have a number of, a number of food programs here at the center. So one being obviously our emergency uh, food program, um, which is really great. So residents can come and um, access food when they are in need. We also have a number of food-based social enterprises uh, here at Rideau Rockcliffe as well. Um, so one being uh, the Ottawa Good Food Box, um, another being Market Mobile. One of our new initiatives that started this year as response to COVID is called Good Food on the Move, and it's a click and collect um, online store, and we have seven pickup locations uh, throughout the city. Um, more sort of local here uh, for Ward 13 residents, we've also started um, a free produce market as well. So community members can come on Wednesdays and Fridays and be able to access additional free fruits and vegetables. Social Harvest Ottawa is one of the social enterprises here at the Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Centre. We operate this great urban greenhouse and our work is not only to grow nutritious and delicious food, but also to nourish communities with community members um, here in Ward 13 and beyond. The greenhouse is a year-round project. Uh, we're a team of four employees working here. Uh, we have two full-time employees and two part-time employees. We focus on growing microgreens from uh, late fall to early spring and hot, hot, hot house crops uh, in the summertime, such as uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. The Mission Food Truck has now, we're in our fifth week of uh, collaborating with them to come visit our center. And we just got in on it at the right time. They were looking for new communities to branch out to. They said, absolutely. Right now they're funded through donations. They travel around Ottawa um, and, and just give out delicious, fresh, hot food um, to people as well. We have at our center the Ottawa Good Food Box, um, as well as the Market Mobile. So Ottawa Good Food Box has been around for 25 years, um, and Market Mobile is a little younger, started in 2014. So they are both have the mission and the mandate of making fresh food more accessible um, and affordable in neighborhoods that lack access to, an, to a grocery store. So I think the, the greatest need that we've seen as a result of the pandemic in our um, community is, is people that we maybe have never needed to access our services um, before, right? So a lot of people have had, um, you know, layoffs, um, you know, maybe they're just not able to work because they have to stay home with their, with their children, you know, over the summer, that sort of thing. So we, we've definitely seen um, the need uh, go out, particularly for our, our food programming, as well as some of our counseling um, services as well. So it's, you know, it's, it's a heavy time for people emotionally. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show, the phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. The wheels on the old train crack and break, crack and break, and fall off. The wheels on the old train crack and break, all through by town. The doors on the old train open and shut, open and shut, open and shut. The doors on the old train open and... Why isn't it shutting? Why isn't the door shutting? The people on the train go, what the f***? Now I'm late, thanks a lot. The people on the train go, what the f***? And transfer to a bus. The Blame a City Hall goes round and round, round and round, round and round. The Blame a City Hall goes round and round, but nobody ever gets fired. The cost of the train goes up and up, up and up, 
up and up. The cost of the train goes up and up. Now let's talk about phase two. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was written by comedian Glenn Foster, performed by his friend, musician, comedian Rory Gardner. And we thank them for their permission to use that here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Look, I read this letter, rail safety advisory letter. That dropped yesterday from the Transportation Safety Board. David alerted me to this yesterday afternoon. Uh, he called me and said, Rob, you've got to read this thing. It's unbelievable. So I um, I followed David's marching orders, as I always do, and I read it, and then I read it, and I read it again. This way. It is eye-popping stuff, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's basically a day in the life of a light rail train here in Ottawa, a specific day. Eighth day of August, the day of the first derailment. Eighth day of August. What happened that day? Well, I would say these are the words that you don't want to see in a letter from a government agency describing your basically brand new state-of-the-art $2 billion light rail system. Undetected catastrophic failure. Because that's what happened. It was an undetected catastrophic failure. Undetected. Undetected. It went undetected because this train system does not come equipped with the technology to um, detect a catastrophic failure. But I want to give you kind of the bullet points, walk you through what happened. I encourage you all to read this. It's all it's all publicly available. So 8th of August, as I mentioned, it's 1.25 p.m. The train is traveling east from Searville to Blair Station. Blair is the last station in the east, right? And a wheel, described in this report as the number three wheel, failed. Totally normal, right? Failed wheels, totally normal. The train car in question, according to this letter, quote, experienced multiple wheel slip warnings during this time. Train reaches Blair Station, turns around, Starts going back west toward Tunney's. By now, it's 2.50 in the afternoon. And the operator of the train reports that they smell something burning. Uh, Something's burning. Something burning. Something burning. And the operator thinks it's probably a sticking brake, a caliper stuck. 3 p.m., technician arrives, reports burn marks. Burn marks on uh, a brake disc. Okay. Totally normal. Again, totally normal. Two, two billion dollars, right? Yeah. Um, quote, the brake was isolated and the calipers were released and the train was taken out of service. Okay. Good call. Good call. Good call. But not before it had traveled all the way to Tunney's Pasture. <laughs> not before it had traveled all the way to Tunney's Pasture. They hold it there. They hold it there. Now we fast forward, it's quarter after eight in the evening, technician takes a look at the brakes, observes the train moving back and forth on the tracks, moving back and forth, we're moving back and forth, we're moving back and forth. Okay, we clear this train to go back to the maintenance yard, which I assume is near the train yards there, that big maintenance yard, right? Train leaves 15 minutes later, And literally minutes later, after switching tracks, there was, quote, an unusually rough ride. The train was brought to a controlled stop, and that's when it was discovered two wheels had derailed. They decide at that point to re-rail the train. At 11 o'clock. We'll re-rail the train at 11 o'clock. And as they're doing that, they discover that one of the wheels is no longer attached to the axle. And it's not even the same car that originally had the problem. It's another car. There's two cars on each train, right? It had been severed severed because of a, quote, previously undetected catastrophic 
roller bearing failure and subsequent axle journal burnoff. Whatever the heck that is. I don't even want to know. And in the letter, there are pictures of this catastrophic failure. And, and David, you looked at them. I looked at them. What do they look like? Melted parts, right? They looks like the part just they melted. Does not look Does good. Does not look good, right? No. no. Like, where is Alstom? Is it in the uh, like a former Soviet Republic Alstom? Where is that? Where are these trains made? That, I think know. it's France or something, isn't it? Uh, because this stuff, it reminds me of something. I would expect this on a Lada or something. Do they have steel there? Or? So, what happened next, okay? They later found the, the, the roller bearings. Oh, I love this. The roller bearings themselves, they find them on the track near Ottawa U. Near Ottawa U. Now, the derailment happened at Tunney's Pasture. They found the parts at Ottawa U. <laughs> right? Like... How many kilometers away is that? Five kilometers away? Something like that? The next morning, 3.30 in the morning, they pull the entire fleet of light rail, rail vehicles out of service. Further inspection. They do further inspection. Oh, lo and behold, there are nine more other vehicles. Exact same problem. Potential for catastrophic failure. That is all in this letter. Okay. How could something like this this happen this is the interesting part of the story the way these things are assembled these particular parts of these trains the letter says they are quote inboard of the wheels meaning they are difficult to inspect visually hard to see there it also means that um it's preferable to have detectors or sensors because they're visually difficult to inspect there is no wayside or onboard system in place to monitor the operating temperature of axle roller bearings that are located inboard of the wheels. So I guess you could say, I'm a layman, they're riding blind, ladies and gentlemen, they're riding blind. And it says, because of this lack of a monitoring device, the cartridge assembly can potentially fail catastrophically. Such a failure can lead to derailment. And the city knew this had the potential of happening. That's in the letter, too. Be but it felt it had, ah, we don't need those. We will do regular maintenance, and that will be sufficient. Okay? Catastrophic failure. Catastrophic failure. Would you take public transit if you had another option? I remind you of those two words, ladies and gentlemen. Catastrophic failure.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, September 28th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 11 degrees, and here's what's making news of this hour. A firm that agreed to review the safety of the LRT has now been dropped by the city. Ottawa informing the company STV it would be using their services, or it wouldn't be since it was involved in the construction of Phase 1 LRT. The city wants to maintain the public trust in the process of looking at the safety of that line, so it will look for a company that has not been involved to review the system. The city manager will report back to city council when that company has been secured. COVID modeling numbers give us an indication of where COVID rates could be over a specific period of time. Now, since the last modeling numbers were released in Ontario, the province has recorded under 1,000 cases a day. The worst case scenario in those figures was for a daily case count around 4,000. This afternoon, the latest projection range for new cases will be released at 2 o'clock. Latest numbers from the province. Actual numbers show another 466 new cases of COVID and 11 deaths. Almost 24,000 tests were done for the new case count. 2.1% of these tests came back positive. 31 of the new cases are in Ottawa, 7 in Eastern Ontario's Health Unit, 5 in Renfrew. There are two new cases today in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. City News Time, 1032. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Would you take public transit? Even if you had another option. Your own car, Uber, rent a car, bicycle, piggyback. 750-1310, 750-1310, Andy, Ottawa. Good morning, Andy. You're on City News, I, Andy. Good, 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 doing, good, 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 good. I'm on fire today, Andy, if you want to know the truth. I don't blame but, you. Uh, I don't blame you, Rob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to say, like, uh, this was a bad idea from the beginning. A bad really. idea, <laughs> yeah. Because, really, when you look at North America, we have the highest amount of cars per household. North America has the highest amount of cars per household. Do you know why? Because people don't want to sit there, especially in a city like Ottawa, uh, sit beside people and, uh, you know, get huddled up in a huge train station. They feel like a bunch of cattle being herded onto a herd, and then they can't even get onto the bus. Well, I would say, I would say, Andy, you're onto something there uh, that uh, a public transit a big new investment in a public transit system like this and the idea that you're going to get people to give up their car keys for presto cards i think that was yeah. always going to be a tough sell because i don't think we have the same kind of say public transit culture that they do in other cities like new york city exactly. manhattan whatever sure uh, you know millionaires do, uh, you know uh, millionaires are taking uh the subway to get to work in manhattan sure even in toronto yeah, yeah. even in toronto they have a, a, a yeah, more exactly. of a public transit culture right go you know get on the Exactly. Go train to but go have, downtown. They also whatever. have high density, uh, Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High density. Ottawa, Ottawa is spread out. This is what Jim Watson doesn't understand. When you have bureaucrats negotiating billion-dollar deals, this is the result that you get. And this is not the first time. This is just another example of the daily life of the government, top to bottom, from municipal to federal. Do you remember the submarines the British sold us? Oh yeah, the dud subs. Okay, yeah, that's sure. another. Yeah. That's another example. They're laughing yeah, yeah. at us. Well, yeah, I, I don't want. I don't want to get too off track and in get into. Pocket. Yeah, I don't want to get too off track and all the all the messed up procurement. But uh, there are serious questions about this one. I mean, there are parts melting on our light rail train. Like, how hot does it have to get down there under the train that the wheels melt? <laughs> Holy smokes, man. Joan in Orleans. Joan, good morning, Joan. Yes, good, good morning. Hi, Rob. Joan. Oh, Sorry today. to keep... Ro uh, yeah. Rob, just a very brief... Um, yes. I turned on your program a little while ago. Just a brief comment, not so much on the real system and all the bus service and all that stuff. I have a very brief comment okay. regarding cyclists. Great. Cyclists are great if they stick to their cyclist lanes. Yes. But if there, if there is an, emerge, an emergency, 
um, that they do have to resort to a sidewalk for a brief, uh, a brief ride. Please, cyclists, don't try to run over the pedestrians. Be careful. The, the sidewalk is the right of the pedestrian. You can ride, I believe, a cyclist can ride if there's an emergency. And if you're not having proper working bells on your bicycle, yes, you're supposed if you to. don't need to have a license to ride your bike on the sidewalk, don't need that. Do, no. do be careful. Do, do be careful. Now, uh, uh, Joan, Joan, it sounds mm. like there's a story behind that call. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Were you... Uh, <laughs> I live in the I live in Orleans, and uh, okay, I don't want to bore you with it, but uh, <laughs> really, okay. I have had the wits scared out of me a few times with oh, really? the cyclists okay. sweeping past okay. me, having a clue. And these are not these are not young teens; these are adult people. Mostly, I I hate to say it, mostly males, men. Yeah, don't say. Yeah, don't say. All right, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank cheerio. You. Yeah, cheerio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe uh, says, Carling, you're calling from Carling Avenue, I guess. Joe. Yes, sir. I was driving down Carling. How are you this morning? Yes, sir. Good, Joe. Thanks. Would you, would, I mean, would you trade in your car keys for a Presto card, basically? Leave the car at home, not take a public, chance. not, a, not chance. a chance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Why? No, Why? I, we should have built a subway in Ottawa. We should have built a subway. Well, we've got, a, I guess, what qualifies as two and a half kilometers worth of subway here, right? So Not in my world. You know, no. Just here. Caller was a second ago was talking about New York City and how they have a subway culture or whatever it is and uh, how expensive things are there. Actually, the price of housing in New York City is, in some cases, cheaper than Ottawa. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I don't think they, it's anything different in New York City than here. And I think the mayor did the, the city a disservice by going late rail. And Ottawa has a history of doing this. I mean, look at the... Uh, the Rideau Canal, that was ahead of its time, and I put Colonel Bly in jail at one point for all cost overruns. Cost overruns, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, point, you know, the Rideau Canal still uh, works, though. It does. Largely yeah. as intended, <laughs> right? Yes. We haven't actually had these fantasies of, you know, filling the Rideau Canal in with cement, which I'm sure more than a few people have had uh, ideas of filling in our light rail tunnel with cement, so... Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we're going to have to redesign our entire transit system. I mean, I would love to see Bank Street when you hit Fourth Avenue, those places going downtown. Yeah. I would love to see cars banned. And I have two vehicles myself. Okay. I would love to see cars banned, put a tunnel there, let cyclists oh, okay. and, yeah. and pedestrians enjoy that. I mean, we have, what, 15,000 people in the city? Well, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, there are all kinds of places, I guess, that you could put a tunnel. There were ideas that as soon as you got off the Queensway at Nicholas, uh, you would go into some kind of vehicle tunnel. No reason you couldn't put transit in there. Come out, um, you wouldn't come out of it until you were on the other side of the Quebec side or something like that. Um, you, you know, you're mentioning this, you know, sort of a old Ottawa South Tunnel, where it narrows there through the Glebe, you're saying there are plans, you know, some people are advocating for a tunnel under Spark Street, for example. I don't know, there are all kinds of plans for all kinds of tunnels. It'll be, sounds like the big dig in Boston to me. We're going to start <laughs> digging, who knows when it'll end. All right, Joe, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yep, yep, good call. Uh, Roy, in Ottawa, you're on City News. Roy. Roy, hey, how are you? I'm good, Roy. L let me ask you this. Would you leave the car at home and take public transit? Absolutely. You would? Okay. All right. For sure. All right. If it's safe. If it's safe. They, okay. They, well, they got to make sure it's safe and then build my confidence in safeness. But this LRT is supposed to work. It is supposed to work. We can criticize it all right now. But it will work when it gets going. But when will that be? I'm well, not well, sure, where's but... where's the evidence of that? Well, may, we're may, not sure. There's <laughs> other cities that had it. Yes. And it looked like it worked there, but they didn't want to talk to them. But if you look at what it costs to park downtown, and you commute to downtown, mm -hmm. the it, it is a it is feasible to be a Petro Pass person, and it does make sense. Yeah, one twenty-two fifty for a monthly pass now for OC Transport. One twenty-two fifty. 
Yeah, but that's a lot less than six hundred dollars to park your car. Oh, downtown. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then another. I don't know what it costs to park bucks. monthly downtown. I don't think it's six hundred bucks, but. Uh, well, three hundred and fifty, four hundred if you try to get in the NAC, and that's downtown. Well, in the NAC, okay. The NAC parking. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, if you're working downtown in these office buildings, you got to park. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. And to get there on a on a reasonable schedule, this is supposed to work, and I would do it if it worked. But you know, right now we don't know if it's working yet. Well, we do know, it's not. The whole That's fleet right. is off. Is is suspended right now. <laughs> Right. So Mel- Mel- Roy, Roy, parts are melting, sir. Melting on the are tray. We, are we supposed to start from scratch and and? Well, and I don't know, but how many? Way. You know, Roy, we've we have just had reports. A, a letter from the Transportation Safety Board says undetected catastrophic failure. That's what I'm saying. You yeah. you just made me feel unsafe on it. More unsafe? Than I thought well, I it's not me. Like, it's not me, sir. I'm just reading it right from a letter uh, from the Transportation no. Safety Board. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying I. Re- when you said that, I'm like, oh well, maybe my my decision to not ride starts to make it a little more. I want to be safe. Yeah, sure, of and course. And that's the responsibility of the city and the transit. Committee, it is. Right? Yeah, you're right. Right. Thank and you. Then, so somebody's got to do their job. Somebody's got to do their job. I would say. Okay. Thank you, Charles, Ottawa. Charles, you're on City News. Good morning, Charles. Hi, good morning, Rob. All right, you've got all these options. You can Uber it. You've got a vehicle in the car, whatever. Um, Do you trade in all of that and ride public transit instead? That's what I'm asking this morning. Uh, First of all, the first thing we have to trade is the mayor and all his cronies. Everybody who was involved in this project, that's who we have to trade right now. Okay. Or when when do we draw the line? When we start getting casualties, are we going to release... The, the, the bus crash in, in, uh, in Westboro, uh, and then the train is going to be, like you say, totally more catastrophic accident. So the first trade we have to do is everybody in the office of Watson, starting by him and everybody below him, whoever was involved, and approve this, 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 this catastrophe of project. That's all I have to say, Rob. All right, Charles. It's well said, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the frustration that you share. It's probably a little bit more than frustration. You used to, David says he used to pay a hundred bucks a month in the byword market. That's a, that was a screaming deal. If you got a, a parking spot for a hundred bucks a month, it was a really good deal at the time. Yeah. I mean, was it the byword market or was it kind of like, I can see the byword market. From well, there? It, it was a spot behind a low rise apartment building. You knew a guy who knew a guy, knew a guy who knew a guy. It was way down Claret street. It was in a bit of a sketchy well, it's area. Not still the market though. But. Yeah, it was right there in the market, a few blocks away from work. Yeah, okay. Anyway, right. that's expensive. Good, that was a pretty good price. I think it's, I think it's north of $200 for a, say a decent parking spot on the market, but nevertheless. Back to it here. I want to take this call. In the market, Dave. Dave. Hi, Rob. Hey, Dave. Yeah, I think if you wanted to sabotage a transit system, you couldn't do a better job than what the system's doing to itself. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. I mean, it's um, when you're reading that report, uh, what was really bothersome is that um, we were lacking these sort of sensors that would yep. detect these things in yep. advance. Yeah, yeah. But still, that just sort of tells you that... You've got a pretty bad design on your hand. And if even if it was to detect it, you'd still have to stop the train, right? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned yesterday, I have I have a, a, a pickup truck, seven years old. I, it has a sensor on it that tells me when my tire pressure is low. But, yep. you know, we have a $2 billion train. There's no sensor on it to tell me that uh, the wheel parts are starting to melt. I mean, it's kind of well, ridiculous, it, right? It, it, Exactly, yeah. and it's like you know the system just that that just tells me that there are built there there are built-in flaws with this system, and um, it seems to be a design thing. So even if you were had the sensors that tell you something's wrong, it's just going to be telling you that all the time by the looks of it. And your trains are not going to be running in uh, the way they should be. Another thing I just want to throw in there with the system is this, with this train with the train system down, the buses at least when I've been taking them between say two and five in the afternoon are starting to get actual crowd, actually crowded standing room only uh, yeah. 
yeah. again. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I called OC because I was rather concerned. I said, you know, why is it we're going to be expected to show a vaccine passport to get into a sporting event, to a restaurant where we're going to be sitting apart from one another, yeah. but there is no, no passport requirement to get on a bus and stand right beside somebody. That doesn't make any sense. And they yeah. just were kind of non Right, It well. runs counter to every word of advice from any public health official anywhere in the country, sir. Exactly. What's happening? Um, train, um, you know, yeah. like what uh, Kelly Egan was mentioning in his column. You've got exactly. Yes, I read program, Kelly's column. And, you, and you've yeah. got a bus. Uh, buses that people don't feel safe riding in so it's no wonder people are taking their cars yeah. hey let me ask you dave uh my producer here says the last time he had a parking spot on the market he paid a hundred bucks a month for it that sounds like a deal to me dave uh, you're down on the market is that that sounds like a screaming deal to me a um, hundred bucks a month for a parking spot on the market that's a pretty good price wouldn't you say well, if it's the indoor ones where you... No, it's outdoor. Sort of, outdoor. It was outdoor. Out, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I'm not yeah. aware. I've only... Whenever I've come to the market, I've either walked or taken the oh, car. Oh, I see. Okay. You, know, you don't have a parking spot indoor. on the market. You don't have a parking spot on the no, market. Eh? No, no, I don't. No. All right. All right. I just thought I'd pick your brain, Dave. Thank you. But I'll talk to you later, day. Dave. i got to go. Uh, 10... 47 holy smokes the hour is flying by it's the talk back hour on the rob snow show 7501310 take part in the conversation we're talking about your failing catastrophically failing your public transit system here on city news show.
The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Would you take public transit if you had another option? Some people have no other option. They rely on OC Transpo. But what if you're someone who, and you have all kinds of other options? Given the news recently, would you, you know, like, you know, park the car and take public transit, given the recent news. 750-1310, 750-1310. In Shawville, Keith. Good morning, Keith. Good day. Good day. Andrew Hayden was absolutely right. We should have just used those tunnels for buses. Okay. And people wouldn't have to transfer. You could have desic- Oh, I would say the bus system actually was doing pretty good before they started this electric uh, rapid transit uh, People were yeah, but you know, buses, buses aren't sexy. Yeah. I know, but they could have switched to electric buses. <laughs> could have switched to electric develop- buses, I suppose. Yes, yes, and we're going to buy a bunch of those too. Uh, anyway. Rose, uh, I refer back to prof- your conversation with Professor Lee this morning. He said we we're rushing into some of these things. We've got to make sure we get the infrastructure. But buses would have been so good. It would get use those tunnels to get through the traffic at rush hour and. People would have been happy on their way. They wouldn't have had to transfer so much. But. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, it, it, we've seen what happens if, you know, something happens with one of the trains. That's right. They the whole, system, the whole system is shut down, whereas, you know, if it's a bus, you, well, you call a tow truck, they tow the bus away, and you're on your way, right? That, so That's right. Yeah. For sure. They yeah. could still yeah. go ahead and make all these special passages just for the buses they would have been so much quicker for right. everybody yeah yeah there are merits to it but the, you know we had entire elections over this yeah you know well, that former mayor that uh he was, doesn't seem so wrong now was it O'Leary? what was his name shirelli no shirelli no, not shirelli but uh, o'leary uh, who's uh, well no it was larry o'brien that pressed larry the o'brien, reset well me. he he pressed the reset button and got us into this well well yeah. 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 I'm gonna have to give. No, but I'm Hayden, gonna have, uh, you get Hayden. I'd like to hear his comments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I. I. Okay. Yeah. We should actually. You know, we've had Shirelli on. We may as well chase Larry and um, find out if he has any regrets. He's not one to have regrets, if I know Larry O'Brien and the conversations that we've had in the past. But he had he hit the reset button and said. Any trip on a world-class transit system starts with an escalator ride down, he said. And that's how he defended his decision. And he had a consultant's report that said, if you, if you build this thing at grade, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. Uh, nevertheless, that years ago now, and Andy, as you know, Andy Hayden, former regional chair, was never in favor of rail at all. And... Um, said bus rapid transit has served us well and will continue to serve us well. But that's not what the people wanted. They had a chance to to to, to have their say in an election. Shiloh, Ottawa, Shiloh. Is it Shiloh? I, yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you. I'm okay with riding on the light rail, but since COVID, I'm a little concerned. Okay. And I just want to say, like, maybe people that refuse to be vaccinated but are still allowed on the bus, maybe they should pay a little more. Okay. or have designated seats in the bus. I don't know. Or, like, if there'd be a way we can identify them so they wouldn't get as sick as much. Well, maybe, you know, along with you know, flashing your Presto card or whatever you do these days with your Presto card, maybe maybe there's going to come a time. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it right now. Maybe maybe you, maybe you have to show your, your vaccine coat on your phone in order to get on the bus or on the train yeah, or well, whatever. Or if we can have them, like, sitting in the back yeah the you know what i i don't think you know one cough and that's gonna uh, undo all of that yeah, so or if we can identify them maybe with a gold star on their sleeve oh, stop or something. it stop it now stop it now stop it now all right all right you were making some good points until you took your stupid pill stupid 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 and now you're never allowed to call the show again Right? Because of that stupid comment. <laughs> Why do people do that? Like, like grown-ups behaving like dummies, like taking stupid pills and calling radio shows just to act like dim-witted fools. 
Okay. Um, don't do that. Don't call here anymore. Lose our number. Okay. In fact, David's going to star 69 you and make sure that you can't ever call again. And we're calling the radio police on you. <laughs> what do we have coming up after the news? Syndicated columnist Michael Tobe, former speechwriter to Stephen Joseph Harper. And uh, Michael had a column recently in the National Post why the Conservative Party should stick with Aaron O'Toole and um, not wander down the road of turfing O'Toole, having a, a, you know, a leadership convention, outcome unknown, direction of uh, the Conservative Party unknown as well. But um, with Aaron O'Toole, if this is the authentic Aaron O'Toole, I guess now you more or less know what you're going to get with the guy. He wants to move the party more to the center, maybe even <laughs> uh, center left. But if the political center in this country itself is actually moving to the left, then maybe that's where you want to be. So uh, we'll get into that with Aaron O'Toole. Uh, not Aaron O'Toole, Michael Tobe, coming up right after the um, 11 o'clock news, then a quarter after 11. What are we doing at quarter after 11, David? Crypto. Oh, yes, crypto. Crackdown. Uh, the crypto crackdown, yeah, that's that's one of the issues that we're going to talk about today when it comes to financial markets. You had China saying we crypto is basically not allowed in China. And that has sent the, the crypto market into, I won't say a tailspin, but it's certainly not as red hot as it once was. But there are all sorts of things that are so interesting that are happening in financial markets. You have stocks that are down right now, but you have energy stocks that are doing very well because you have energy prices, oil prices, natural gas prices, coal prices. They're all rallying. What is that? That is potentially inflationary. What happens when you have inflation? You get higher interest rates. And the, the real story in financial markets right now is what is going on with so-called bond yields, namely the 10-year U.S. bond, which hit 1.5% yesterday. It's a massive move. So there are lots of big happenings in financial markets. We'll talk about that. Hans Albrecht will join us from Horizons ETF. So uh, busy hour. Still ahead here on the Rob Snow Show on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, September 28th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 11 degrees, here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Riley Brockington has had just about had it with recent LRT issues, but also with how officials seem to be downplaying the severity. The transit commissioner says we are co- uh, consistently hearing from top city brass the train runs at 98 percent. He's tired of disingenuous comments. It's this unreliable, uh, inconsistent service delivery that's gotten people so upset. And so, yeah, it might work fine at 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, but when people need to take the system, it has not consistently been there, and that's why people are so upset. Now, Brockington says the most important aspect of a trusted transit system is its reliability. Now, the Transportation Safety Board yesterday revealed Rideau Transit Maintenance needs to be doing a better job of maintaining the fleet of buses, while also pointing to the city that a heat warning system would have prevented the most recent rail derailment. The firm that agreed to review the safety of LRT has now been dropped. The city informed the company, STV, it wouldn't use their services now since that company was involved in construction of Phase 1. The city wants to maintain the public trust in the process, so we'll look for another company that has not been involved with Ottawa's LRT to this point. City manager will report back to city council when that company has been secured. City News Time 11.02 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Most areas should have a fair amount of sunshine today. The high just 16 degrees. Now that's average though. A few clouds tonight near 7 and tomorrow mainly cloudy with the high about 14 degrees. For today the high 16. And right now it's 11 degrees in both Ottawa and Smith Falls. Latest numbers from the province show another 466 cases of COVID today and 11 more deaths in Ontario. Almost 24,000 tests were done for the new case count. The number that came back positive, 2.1%. 31 of these new cases are in Ottawa, 7 in eastern Ontario, 5 in Renfrew, 2 new cases in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. There are now fewer than 10 miners still underground in the Totten mine near Sudbury. The United Steelworkers Union reports uh, 27 had returned safely to the service. Their uh, surface, they're being checked over now by a team of doctors. There were 39 miners that were trapped Sunday as deep as 1,200 meters underground due to a mechanical problem. No one was hurt and the mine owner expects the last of the workers will be out shortly. The OPEC oil cartel is predicting crude will continue to be the leading source of energy for a couple of decades to come, especially as poorer countries seek higher growth and a higher standard of living. Its annual World Oil Outlook report states the rise of electric vehicles and the push for alternative and renewable energy will bring in an area of declining an era of declining demand in oil for rich countries. But it forecasts energy needs of expanding economies in other parts of the world will still leave oil as the world's number one source of energy at least through 2045. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. He's with us every week. Syndicated columnist, Troy Media, Looney Politics, National Post. Former speechwriter for Stephen Harper, Michael Tobe. Welcome back. Hello, Michael. Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm good. It's great to hear from you again. Thank you so much. I wanted to begin uh, with the case that you made in the National Post recently Mm -hmm. uh, for conservative supporters to stick with Aaron O'Toole. Why do you think conservatives should stick with the leader, Aaron O'Toole? Well, there were a variety of reasons, but very, very briefly, um, I felt that overall his campaign, while far from perfect, and we know that, uh, hit a lot of the right notes. I mean, he did emphasize, obviously, fiscal prudence. He emphasized moderate social values, where he said he was, for example, pro-choice when it came to abortion. Um, The problem was that, unfortunately, 
He also walked away from one of the core principles of conservatism at times, which is fiscal conservatism. And based on the fact that he called for a lot of public spending or a lot of government spending and many different programs, like the other political leaders did too, it just made the message very confusing for Canadians and for a lot of voters. Um, Overall, though, he ran an effective campaign. There's no question that the campaign was running on all cylinders through literally from start to finish couple of minor hiccups here and there we talked about one of them the two day or so controversy about guns but by and large the messaging was pretty strong to me the issue is overall if you believe in the historical theory that a party leader deserves two kicks at the can or two chances to win an election which i typically do and if you believe overall that there wasn't a mitigating failure or an overall failure in the campaign that and overall, it ran effectively but made mistakes, of which I think the O'Toole campaign and probably Mr. O'Toole himself would acknowledge was part of the equation. What do you do to improve it? So I basically suggested that you know he needs to go back to a model that's been used by the last three conservative leaders, that being my old friend, boss Stephen Harper, Andrew Scheer, and obviously Mr. O'Toole, which is to use incremental conservatism or finding a balance between fiscal and social issues on the conservative cycle that resonate not only with small C conservatives, but also resonate with Canadians. And the way to do it is to start to use models and concepts that other political leaders who are conservatives have used effectively. The U.S. Republican Party certainly has examples. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Historical examples like Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, even Brian Mulroney, if you wish. And I even mentioned you can actually take a little tiny piece, believe it or not, from former U.S. President Donald Trump in the way that he realigned the Republican Party and work relationship with the working class, which is actually something that Mr. O'Toole did himself during the campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, conservative parties, points. conservative parties, or conservative leaders are trying to do that. Uh, certainly, it's been a key to um, Prime Minister Johnson's success in the UK. Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe less so uh, in the O'Toole case. Maybe he has to try and keep making that pitch. I'm, I'm just not well, sure. He to, um, yeah, he has to keep sorry, making sorry. the pitch. But yeah, at the same yeah, time, yeah. he's got to also deviate the message. If he follows the same line that he did in the previous election, we know that it can only go so far. The Conservatives have had gone right, center, right, and center over the last few campaigns. So they need to obviously move back to the central right, which is the natural constituency, but create policies and ideas and concepts that resonate with everyone Whereas during this campaign, it resonated with some, but not with others. Okay. So what would be some of the drawbacks then, you know, let's say, the, 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 you know, the, the, the caucus, the caucus sets the party on this path. You're gone. We, you know, you let us down. Uh, we have to get a new leader here. Um, well, yeah, it, it, what are the drawbacks to, to all of that then? Um, well, and it's covered in my column. If the yeah. Conservative Party leadership is based on a revolving door philosophy that every single time we don't get the result we want, we just basically say, oh, to hell with this. We're done with this. We don't <laughs> like this leader. Let's just start again and Let's shuffle the door. Yeah. You know, that doesn't make the party politically viable at all. In fact, yeah. it makes it unviable or non-viable. And the real key here is, yes, there have been political leaders who've only – had their leadership for one term and moved on. Like Andrew Scheer was the leader for one election for the Conservatives. Michael Ignatieff and Stefan Dion were leaders of the Liberal Party for only one election. There's no rule that says that Mr. O'Toole has to continue on, but overall he did enough to, as I said, fiscal prudence, moderate social values, he increased the Big Ten philosophy, you know, major gains in Atlantic Canada where there have been very little seats or very few seats the past few elections, and the proof is in the pudding that overall, he still won the popular vote, second straight conservative leader to knock <laughs> Justin Trudeau into second place that way, yeah. even though it obviously doesn't count in our first past the post system, it still means something. J Justin Trudeau is our prime minister. He roughly has 32.6% popularity. That's all he's got. Yeah. So basically he's running the country when close to 68% of the country opposed him in some fashion. So I think that is obviously helpful. And while Mr. O'Toole did not run a perfect campaign, he ran an efficient campaign. And for that reason, 
with some tinkering along the lines of what I suggested or Mike Harris, the former Ontario Premier, suggested in Sun Media and others will obviously suggest over time, I think it can be moved into the right direction. Okay. How do you explain the Conservative Party's GTA problem? Look, if you can't win the, the GTA, Har- when Harper won the majority in 2011, um, they won 78 Ontario seats and, and won entire suburbs. Uh, mm-hmm. They, they yeah. swept every riding in Brampton, for example. Um, yeah. Bill Davis, you say you win Brampton, you're going to win. Uh, the Liberals won 50 GTA seats. The Conservatives won six. True. Uh, um <laughs> No, you're right. What's the what, what, what happened there? What, what and how do you fix that? How do you fix something like that? It's emblematic of the issue that they're facing. But again, we you know in politics, especially federally, we have faced this before. At least conservatives have. You know, during Jean Chrétien's several runs for over ten years as prime minister, he had a couple of periods, as you may remember, where he ran roughshod on Ontario and virtually won everything on one occasion. I think it was, what, 101 out of 102 or 102 out of 103. And the second time around, he still won close to 100 or slightly over. You know, unfortunately, there are periods of time when the pendulum swings in politics and certain parties are stronger in certain provinces. And unfortunately, that is a problem the Liberals, not just in Ontario, but as you specifically point out, the GTA, which is a core area, has a rich, you know, huge number of seats, which are so it's, it's rich in votes. Ergo, if a political party such as the Conservatives wants to form power, they have to do well out there. Again, I think the key is because the messaging of the party has shifted a lot since Stephen Harper lost in 2015 and to sort of bounce back through Andrew Scheer's attempt to try to sort of run an incremental conservative model, but he couldn't really figure out the difference between or couldn't establish the difference between his own social conservative values, the party's social conservative values, and the country's values as well. That caused some problems. The, the problem also issue here is that Aaron O'Toole walked away at times from fiscal conservatism, or at least that was the perception that he gave, and that actually turns off, quite frankly, a lot of voters, including heavily in the GTA, where you have a lot of middle class small business owners who feel that their tax dollars are being stretched to the limit, not just because of COVID-19, but in general. So, again, you have to restructure your messaging. You have to basically work hard, as Aaron O'Toole will have, at least another 12 to 18 months or more, depending on how long this minority government lasts. On top of the year that he's been around as a national leader, he now has a chance to continue to establish himself and build a much stronger foothold in the GTA by basically taking small-c conservative positions on taxes the size of government, individual rights and liberties, and and obviously emphasizing things such as health care, education, the environment, uh, foreign policy matters, and try to just basically hit the liberals hard as much as they can with a very weak and ineffective prime minister in place, and hopefully the pendulum will shift and things will tilt. That's the only thing they can really do. Okay. This is the political soundbite of the week uh, to me. Anime Paul in a park in Toronto yesterday saying, I quit. I'm out of here. I'm done in by my own party. Let's listen to this clip here. What I didn't realize at the time is that I was breaking a glass ceiling that was going to fall on my head and leave a lot of shards of glass that I was going to have to crawl over, um, you know, throughout my time as a leader. And when I arrived at that debate stage, I had crawled over that glass. I was spitting out blood, but I was determined to be there. Spitting out blood. My gosh. What is your reaction to the resignation of Annamie Paul as leader of the Green Party? Have you ever seen anything like that in all your time following politics, Michael? Not in the slightest. I have never heard a description like that. I have never seen anything like that. I've never witnessed an allusion to anything like that. It's astonishing. Now, we know, and you and I talked about it, I've talked about it with others, and so have you, we know that there have been enormous amounts of problems with the Green Party of Canada. This is not a major revelation. But when Annamy Paul announced that she will be stepping down, I think in a, roughly two weeks she'll be leaving the post, but basically she's on her way out, she was far more honest at this presser than she was at the previous one in terms of the analogy that she used in terms of dealing with the party infighting, dealing with the executive council, 
the fact that there was enormous amount of blowback. She has alleged things such as racism and other components, which, you know, you put it all together, whether you believe some of it, don't believe others, or just look at her as her personal perspective on a very difficult period of time. Enemy Paul basically brought out a, a, a perception that the Green Party of Canada has just become a shambles. It really has. It was never a major political party. And aside from the enthusiastic response of some Green Party supporters, it was never going to form government in this country. Oh, no, no, no. None of the others have. The Green, you know, the German Greens, the UK Greens, they're not even close. And, and I mean, the German Greens have at least been part of coalition governments. Our Greens in Canada have been around a long time, since the mid-1980s, but are nowhere near that. But the fact that they dropped from, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I have the numbers right, 6.5% roughly in 2019, the federal election, to roughly 2.3% in 2021, that's an astonishing drop, even if they still held two seats. But enemy poll, look. Seemed to be a nice woman. You know, she handled herself decently in the leaders' debates. I think most people would acknowledge that. And she got screwed in a lot of different ways. Her party took money away from not only her national campaign, but her own personal campaign in Toronto Centre. She was completely ham-fisted. And if that's the case, you can't run an effective campaign. And there have been clearly problems from the very beginning. Even Elizabeth May, the former leader of the Green Party for so many years, has not said a word. No, she hasn't yeah. said anything. All, no, it, it's, it's interesting, Michael. Years. All the leaders were on social media yesterday, on Twitter yesterday, saying congratulations for your contributions uh, to the political dialogue, even the prime minister, you know, and they really went yeah. at each other during the debate. Um, uh, Said, so, you know, I like your tenacity, all of, all of these things. So, so um, for Elizabeth May to be so quiet throughout all of this affair makes me wonder what she's up to. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, you know, everyone has speculated, rightly or wrongly, that she may have been a part of this. You yeah. know, obviously she's denied it and people around her have denied it. And we have to accept that as the public voice right now. But you're right, Rob, and that's what you're sort of alluding to. The fact that Elizabeth May hasn't really said much of anything, has not been interviewed, has not tweeted anything other than to retweet one of Annamie Paul's tweets when she announced that she was stepping down, which is not a response. That's just basically, oh, great, click, and off it goes. The fact that Elizabeth May has said nothing really speaks volumes, not only about her own position and her own relationship with Annamie Paul, which I think we know based on previous interviews on CBC, CTV, and otherwise, was not very good. I mean, I believe May said at one point she hadn't spoken with Paul in months, so we know their relationship was poor, but it also shows how the real party machine behind the Green Party, which was mostly aligned with Elizabeth May, who was their their strongest and most successful political leader in the past few elections, it really shows how much was really out there against enemy Paul and yeah. possibly working or even, if you want to use the term, conspiring against enemy Paul from the very beginning. And that says a lot, and it shows really how far the Green Party has fallen in recent years. Michael Tobe, always great to have you on our show. Thank you. My pleasure, Rob. Yeah, Take bye-bye. care. Syndicated columnist. Michael Tobe, Rob Snow Show, City News.
on. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. The Central Bank in China, People's Bank of China, China's Central Bank, announced earlier in the week all transactions involving cryptocurrency are illegal. So, so banning cryptocurrencies like um, Bitcoin, saying it seriously endangers, quote, the safety of people's assets. So what does that mean for the future of crypto, if anything? Hans Albrecht is back with us. He's with Horizons ETF. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. Uh, what does this mean for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and some of the others? Well, I'd, I'd say they're hanging in there fairly well, considering this is fairly serious news uh, on the whole. Uh, it's another chapter in, in the sort of China crackdown saga that we've seen of late. Uh, they keep brandishing their regulatory bazookas in the area of technology in general. We saw uh, them cracking down on various, uh, you know, data collecting type apps, uh, certain companies in the education area. Um, so we've sort of seen sort of the last three or four months with China getting more involved in, in some of these private markets and in particular in some of these technologies. Um, so it, it, it is very interesting, uh, I'd say. Uh, you know, early on, they cracked down on the miners, which is sort of the more physical aspect of, of the cryptocurrencies that you're talking about, Rob, the sort of the, the mining rigs that are involved in, in basically uh, creating this Bitcoin over time. Uh, and then more recently, as to what you've uh, mentioned, uh, they're cracking down on um, on people getting involved in any possible way. And they've put, and they've put warnings out to companies that are, have even moved offshore uh, that are allowing Chinese customers and clients to do business in crypto. They want to crack down on absolutely all of that, um, which could have interesting repercussions for the entire mining industry, given that so many of these mining companies are over there in China. So these, mm -hmm. these miners are going to move somewhere. It's, it's a little different than something like mining copper, where you have to kind of go to where the copper is sitting in the ground. Uh, with Bitcoin mining, you can just basically move your rigs and go to wherever the, the energy is cheaper and wherever the, the environment is more welcoming. Right. And by rigs, I mean, I guess you mean like server farms, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, the yeah, complicated yeah. computer uh, sure. uh, rigs that are involved in, in basically extracting uh, Bitcoin. Uh, you know, some it's, it, it, a few years ago, it used to be something that anybody could do with their sort of spare time and with their computer systems. Nowadays, it's pretty complex stuff. Yeah. You, you, you need sophisticated stuff. Yeah, very energy that. intensive, very energy intensive. So uh, 41,400, 41,500 is uh, the U.S. dollar Bitcoin price today, uh, and it started the week at uh, just shy of 45,000. So it's taken it's taken a hit. This news, uh, the Bitcoin has taken a hit because of this news. But is, do you think it's China specific news, or is this an opinion that could spread more globally? Well, I think uh, it, it began as China specific, and I think it, it, you know Bitcoin is a bit of a, a type of risk asset as well. So as we've seen market markets kind of weaken a little bit this week, uh, particularly in the last couple of days, as as they as markets get a little nervous about uh, rising interest rates, we saw the ten-year uh, rise above uh, 1.5 percent, and it was it was around, down around 1.3 percent not long ago. That is that tends to be a little risk off uh, for risk assets like stocks uh, and even things like Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it makes you know technology the the area of technology tends to take a little bit of a hit when when rates rise because low rates, of course, are good for innovation and borrowing and that and that kind of thing. Yeah. Isn't that really just more macro and away from the Bitcoin story and crypto story for a moment? Isn't that really what's kind of driving market sentiment right now? It's really the interest rate story right now and people watching what is that 10 year treasury going to do in the United States and what does this one and a half percent mean, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, when you, when, uh, I mean, I'd be, uh, I'd wager uh, that uh, rates are, we're a little bit low. Let's face it, the economy is doing uh, well enough that, you know, mortgages probably shouldn't be in the low 1% range. Uh, you know, the 10 year probably shouldn't be 1.3%. Uh, 
Uh, we have an economy that's doing fairly well. Uh, job growth has been okay, although it's stalling out a little bit. I think that's part of what the economy is worried about these days is that we've had this sort of nice rebound open. Um, and as, we, as you and I have talked about in the past, markets just have shrugged off just about everything. And we've, we've, we've sort of, they've kept rising over time. Uh, now valuations are fairly high. Uh, we're seeing COVID numbers sort of spike around the world. It's a very uneven recovery from a COVID perspective around the world. Um, but another thing that uh, I think people are a little bit worried about, Rob, is that uh, on, a, on a sort of darker level, we could be heading for something called stagflation, which was sort of a, mm. uh, uh, something that we saw a little bit more of in the 70s, which is low growth. Combined with inflation, we're seeing inflationary numbers around the world that are quite astonishing and 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 um, and quite sticky. You know, we've even seen things. Of course, if you if you've gone to the gas pump lately, you know that you're paying as much as you did uh, when oil a uh, barrel of oil was double the price of where it is now. A buck, you know, 150 bucks. Um, so you know, prices. You know, if you if you go and buy some steaks at the grocery store, you're you're definitely realizing that uh, a lot of things around us have gotten a little bit more expensive and if we're heading into a period of you know more subdued growth with higher inflation that's a little bit of a concern for investors as well always great to have you on our show thank you so much my pleasure Rob. Yeah, bye-bye um has albrecht vice president horizons etf we revisit the return of the two michaels with professor elliot tepper from carleton university right after the news on city news FM and 1310 AM. This is Tuesday, the 28th of September. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now, mostly cloudy. 12 degrees in Ottawa, 11 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. An about face by Ottawa City Manager on the LRT, deciding to hire a different consulting firm to make sure the O trainee is ready to go back into service when Rideau Transit Maintenance claims that it is. In a memo, Steve Kanalaka says STV was not involved in the design of the Confederation line, but has consulted for the city in the past, and he doesn't want the appearance of a conflict
conflict of interest. A different company will instead be hired. More gunfire, this time in Ottawa's West End. Gunshots heard on Ramsey Crescent in the Foster Farm area around 7 last night. Ottawa police say they found property damage from bullets and spent shell casings, but no one was hurt. The Guns and Gangs Unit is now looking for witnesses. Ontario Science Advisory Table set to release new COVID-19 projections today. Daily case counts have so far remained under 1,000 during the fourth wave, well below the worst case scenario in the previous modeling, around 4,000 daily cases. Today's COVID-19 numbers from the province show another 466 new cases across Ontario. 11 more people have died. The province says Ottawa has 31 new cases, the Eastern Ontario Health Unit 7, Renfrew County 5, and Leeds Grenville Lanark 2 new cases this morning, but updated local numbers will come this uh, afternoon. City News Time 1133. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for an abbreviated version of the world with Professor Elliot Tepper, Distinguished Senior Fellow Norman Patterson School International Affairs at Carleton University. Good morning, Professor. Welcome back. Nice to hear from you. Oh, thank you. And good morning, Rob. And it's great to be uh, having some good news to yes. discuss or change. Your reaction to it, the two Michaels are home. Well, it's excellent news. The uh, the result of a very long process and then an unexpected and swift resolution. Uh, the takeaway on this, I think, is that a package was put together that was win-win-win and could be presented in, for uh, domestic audiences as a plus. The effective lobbying by Canada over a prolonged period of time to keep this situation front and center, including having our ambassador in China spend three weeks in Washington in last April may have helped kickstart this. But uh, ultimately the package was put together. The Chinese said, the only thing we really want is we want Meng Wanzhou home. They are presenting this as a great victory. Uh, the United States is saying she signed an agreement saying that uh, she wouldn't confess to any guilt, but she would attest that all the facts pointing in that direction are correct so that the U.S. can pursue its case against Huawei in court, not against her. And the United States can be happy on that. And, of course, Canada is delighted with the result for us. Okay. What do you think may have been the Chinese government's motivation to do this now? We are still learning about this. Uh, there was a suggestion in the paper a couple of days ago by our ambassador in Washington that there was no quid pro quo, that there was not an insistence by the U.S. to tie the release of the two Michaels to the release of Meng Wanzhou. But now we are hearing today just the other way around. Quite clearly, the U.S. and China, the heavyweights, decided to weigh in on this and put it behind them to remove an irritant in the relationship so that Xi Jinping apparently sent the word down uh, that it's time to get this closed. Joe Biden made it very clear, apparently, uh, according to, and this uh, is what I suspected all along, uh, that he wanted to be sure this was a package deal. And Canada, of course, was playing its role by effective lobbying and presentation of its, of its uh, situation. But basically, this is exactly what it has been all along. A matter between the United States and China with Canada caught in the middle and now the two principals decided it was time to move on and that's where we are. The the highly regarded Bob Fife, the Ottawa Bureau exactly. Chief for the Globe and Mail, reports this morning I'm going to quote from Page Globe Mail negotiations that led to freedom for Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig ramped up in early August after U.S. President Joe Biden became seriously engaged in ending a legal standoff with China, sources say Mr. Biden insisted any deal to drop the U.S. extradition case against Huawei Technologies executive Meng Wanzhou and defer criminal charges could not happen unless the two were released at the same time, according to three sources with direct knowledge of the talks with China, Huawei and Ms. Meng's lawyers. Uh, what would be Joe Biden's motivation to do that? Yes, the, he's an ace reporter, and he's been on this case right from the beginning, and he's very strong on China. He follows the Chinese file very closely. The uh, motivation, apparently, is that the U.S. wants to 
uh, move on to a different stage of relations with China. That is, on the one hand, really stepping up, and as we, we talked about AUKUS last week and so forth, yeah. uh, stepping up the regional security architecture throughout Asia to contain China, but at the same time moving in the opposite direction to try to stabilize and um, lower the temperature so that war is not the logical outcome of the contest between the two powers. And it looks like China has the same motivation, and that's why we have a deal. What does this mean longer term now for the Canada-China relationship? There was a time when the Trudeau government appeared very bullish on pursuing uh, further economic integration with that country. Uh, I wonder if this is um, a teaching moment for the government, if you will, and whether there would be a, a pivot away from such desires. What is your best guess, uh, Professor? It's been a teaching moment for the world. I think the um, quite effective leadership uh, by Canada pointing out the nature of this Chinese regime, the world has really come into, uh, the China's come into focus for the world, and we've helped play a part in that, of course, the wolf warrior diplomacy by China has played the key role in all of it. The world not, does not see, and China is not seen by us in the same way as it was a few years ago before the kidnapping and the hostage taking and the crisis that has now resolved happily. The global opinion of China has been sharply reduced. So we are not starting where we were before. This is not status quo ante. We're starting with a much, as Mark Garneau, the foreign minister, has said, a much more clear-eyed view of the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, the regime in charge of China, trying to separate, of course, the issue of the regime and the people of China, because uh, those are two separate issues. What we have on is a situation where China is now uh, here. We can't ignore the fact they are the world's second largest some say the largest economy in the world, and going forward, that's likely to further be the case. We cannot ignore them. At the same time, we cannot ignore the type of regime they are. So I think the, uh, the formula, you know, you, you coexist, you cooperate when you can, you compete, uh, and then you challenge. That's the Mark Garneau's formulation of one that's um, been put in place by the U.S. and others. So we are in a situation where going forward a major impediment mm -hmm. to relations between Canada and China has been removed. There will be, and indeed, uh, Rob, we've had fairly good economic relations during this time period. But I think everybody's more clear-eyed in how we proceed, including being much more concerned about security and cybersecurity and intellectual property uh, concerns, all of that. We will be dealing with China, but it's a different kind of era that we're in. What, what do you think about, and how should we read this, um, how this whole affair has played out in the Chinese media? She was welcomed uh, home w uh, with rapturous applause. 60 million people apparently yeah. watched it on television in, Twice the population in China, China, right? <laughs> um, and... Uh, if there was any mention at all of the Canadians, it was, well, they're criminals, they're spies, and we let them out on compassionate grounds. Right. How should we interpret their reaction over there? They're claiming this as a triumph of the powerful, rejuvenated China. China was humiliated. This is Xi Jinping's central plank. China, China was humiliated. Uh, now we're not humiliated. Now we're standing forth. There's no more uh, hide your strength and bide your time. We are here. Uh, and the whole reason she was, and in their view, this was a political kidnapping by the West, mm -hmm. uh, that she was locked up because of the rising power of China. And in order to contain that, Huawei had to be contained. And therefore, she was, she was a political prisoner. And also, that's why she was locked up. But she was released because of China's rising power and you couldn't stand in their way. They did present a list in Alaska, the very first meeting between the new administration, Biden's administration and his team with the Chinese. They gave a two-page list, uh, Rob, of saying, here's your bad behavior you have to fix. 
And one of those items was Meng Wanzhou. So they're saying, well, they're just moving down the list in order to get on good terms with us. So we are the power, and everybody has to, uh, has to pay attention to us now. Okay. Um, just finally, there are other very interesting things. We only have a couple of minutes left okay. here, but we have, you know, we have Evergrande, uh, yes. the big uh, re, uh, real estate developer uh, that appears to be uh, teetering, if not going to fail, and right. there are fears about contagion that seem to be contained right now. But th there are also uh, these orders from the leadership for factories to shut down, for uh, coal production and the burning of coal to be curtailed. And there's some speculation that this is about the upcoming Olympics and they want clean air. Uh, they don't want dirty air fouling the, the view of the Olympics. What What, what is your um, guess about what's going on over there well, with my, some of these my decisions? My uh, science guess here. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not an economist. Is sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, the reason the two Michaels were released may have been in part because China wanted to clean out not its air but its image prior to the Olympics. There's a move, after all, to move the Olympics, a very strong movement, actually, and why not bring it back to Canada mm. and Seattle? So there's uh, that kind of move. In terms of China and its economy, the, they cut back on oil, uh, on coal production <laughs> simply because <laughs> they, they couldn't... Um, <laughs> the, the factories are shutting down there, and they were worried that... Um, it's a very complicated mixture of, of arguments. But the broad, the broad picture here is the Chinese economy is slowing. It has some internal contradictions of its own. The Evergrande shows that uh, they, are, they are worried about debt. So they are facing, ironically, the capitalist <laughs> concerns of, of presiding over a Wild West capitalism under Chinese Communist Party domains with state-owned enterprises and state uh, backed champions like Huawei as part of their mixture. Right. So we'll uh, and the potential for some of them to become over levered and yes. and some of the risks yes. associated with that. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, okay. and also, will they interfere? Is this their Lehman Brothers moment? Yeah. Are they going to interfere and save this company or let it have a ripple effect? But yeah. it goes back to one of, one of the comments you and I have already made today. China's already here. They're part of the global economy. Uh, their fate is very much entwined with, with the rest of the world. This could have a particular item could have a contagious effect, but remember, so did COVID. <laughs> so we need to have a relationship with China that is much more wide-eyed, much more realistic than we've had in the past. But we do have to proceed. Thank you, Professor. Oh, you're very yeah, welcome. Great Bob. to hear from you, Professor Elliot Tepper with the World. He's with Carlton. This is City News.
icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This Thursday is Truth and Reconciliation Day, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This was one of the recommendations to come out of the final report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We're joined this morning by Cindy Blackstock, Executive Director, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. Good morning. Good morning. What kind of progress do you think we're making toward reconciliation? I think it's really uneven. I think Canadians are uh, growing more aware of not only what happened in residential schools, but of colonialism writ large. That needs to continue to happen because one of the key lessons that still, I think, needs to be learned is that the injustices are ongoing and the public is absolutely key in making them stop simply by saying to elected officials that we care and we care enough to not let this fall off our radar and we're going to be watching until all the calls to action are implemented and the injustices stop. Okay. What kind of progress have governments made at implementing those recommendations? 94 of them in all, 94 of them in all from that report. Right. So historian Ian Mosby actually does an annual kind of review of all this and he finds that only a handful have actually been implemented and that's really disappointing because we see governments do complicated things all the time like they rolled out serve for example did a good job of that helping yeah. canadians out or out of work because of the pandemic yeah, yeah. so it really raises the question of why is the pace of change on solutions that are evidence-based so glacial when it comes to First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. I mark it down to lack of political will. And we see that in that the government is not only not implementing them, but in some cases is actively fighting to not implement the top call to action, uh, which is equity and child welfare. It is uh, last Friday, Rob, they filed yet another judicial review to deny First Nations families adequate buildings to get prevention services to keep more families together. So uh, that and fighting against residential school survivors from St. Anne's Residential School, where there literally was an electric chair. That's the kind of ongoing thing. That's what happens when the public looks away. There was an electric chair? Really? There was an electric chair. This is St. Anne's Residential School in northern Ontario. And um, in fact, we know that they would put the children into straitjackets, Rob, if you could imagine, and then put them in electric chairs. And what the government did is there, people will remember the residential school settlement for the class action. Yes. But yes. the government withheld all of these records about this investigation so that these survivors couldn't prove their claim. And then the period to make a claim expired and Canada said, oops, you're no longer eligible. And now it's spent over three million of your dollars and my dollars in court fighting against these poor survivors. I want to ask, you know, if Thursday, a lot of people are going to be off. And uh, one of my fears, and I just, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm the only one, but I want to ask you about it. One of, one of my fears about um, a day like, like this one coming up on Thursday is it just becomes another day for people to whatever, um, take the kids somewhere and do an activity, go shopping, you know, whatever. If it falls on a Friday or Monday, maybe people are saying, woohoo, long weekend. How do we... Um, how do we prevent that? How do we get the most meaning out of Truth and Reconciliation Day? I think people need to think of this like Remembrance Day. Remember that children who went to residential schools were more likely to die in the schools than soldiers were in the Second World War. So bring that reverence that you have for veterans, and they deserve it, but bring that type of reverence to these kids. These were children fighting for their lives, literally. Some of them would run away and try and try and get away from the abuse that way. And several of them died even doing that. They, they froze to death. Mm-hmm. So this is the day to not look away. If we really want to build a country where, based on justice and fairness for everyone, then we need to learn to embrace 
our history. We need to learn from it so it doesn't keep happening, the injustices, and that we stop them from happening in the future. Do you and get, there's lots uh, for you no, sorry, to do. Sorry, sorry, Cindy. Do you get the sense, though, that this year and the revelations of this year, um, that it was a turning point? In, in the collective consciousness of, of Canadians that this year marked a turning point uh, for many people? I think it did for many people, but not for enough people. Okay. And what I mean by that, Rob, is we'll all remember uh, folks wearing orange shirts, uh, placing teddy bears, etc., when the unmarked graves were found in Camlets in 215. Well, since then, we are now over 5,000 unmarked graves, and you would hear hardly a ripple in the media about that. So here's a chance for people to really kind of put it back on their radar, read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, send a letter to your member of parliament or tag them on Twitter and tell them that this TRC report matters to you, not just on Thursday, but every day of the year. And when it comes to you going to the voting booth again, it'll matter to you then as well. I want to ask you, do you think, because I think people will wonder, is it appropriate, take someone like me, 50 year old yeah. white male would it be appropriate for me to wear a white or uh, pardon me an orange shirt absolutely and to know where the orange shirt comes from so okay. the orange shirt is uh, phyllis webstad who was a residential school survivor you all remember like you know going to school for the first day or sending your kids to school for the first day when you had to you got to wear something special right and her right. something special was a bright orange shirt made by her grandmother and when she went to residential school, they took that away from her. Okay, okay. And so wearing the orange shirt is just is a, really an honoring of not only the strength of the survivors and their descendants, but it's also that reclaiming of that space. Okay. So everyone should be uh, wearing an orange shirt, or if you got an orange button, uh, We Matters. And if you don't have any of those things, just get yourself out a, a marker and put a We Matter sign out in your front window. Right, just right. It's, do it's something. Not, it's not uh, a cultural appropriation or anything like that. No, Cindy, no, no, no. I think one of the important things to do is whenever possible, if you're going to be buying a T-shirt, uh, try to buy it from um, a First Nations Métier Inuit organization. Right. Um, but if you don't, just wear your orange shirt or whatever you got, just to kind of a show of solidarity. Because reconciliation is not just for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. It's about making Canada uh, a better country too, right? Bringing it in alignment with its values. What will you be doing Thursday? On Thursday, um, I will actually be in Beechwood Cemetery, where we will um, be conducting historical tours of some of the key actors in residential schools. Those people who spoke up back then about why this was wrong and tried to save the kids, and those people who said no. On top of that, we are actually going to be displaying something uh, that's very profound. You know, when you talk about 150,000 kids who went to residential school, it's sometimes hard to land that in your mind about what that actually looks like. So a group called Project to Heart, which is a group of teachers, had students all over Canada paint tiles, little wooden tiles, in memory of one of the children who died in residential schools or the children and the children that survived. So we will be displaying 57,000 of these tiles. Wow. Okay. And that will be a chance for Canadians to get a glimpse of one third of what happened to these children, to actually think about these as not just a statistic, but as real kids who loved orange shirts, who wanted to have a proper meal, who didn't want to be hit anymore, who wanted to grow up to feel proud of who they were. That's what we're going to be doing on Thursday. On Thursday. Okay. Thank you so much for your time this morning. It's so greatly appreciated. Thank you for having me, Rob. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in weekdays starting at 9 on Rogers TV and City News, 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response.